The United States is engaged in military activities throughout Southeast Asia. Several thousand U.S. soldiers have been moved in and out of Thailand, and almost 10,000 U.S. soldiers are training, supporting, equipping, transporting, and fighting with South Vietnamese government troops. Thus far, only a handful of U.S. servicemen have been killed. Is this a war, or isn't it? And, if it is not a war, then when does it become one? Official United States opinion has largely ignored this question. While constitutionally the United States Congress is supposed to share with the President the power of making war, and the United States Senate the making of foreign policy, there has been no major congressional challenge to U.S. participation in the war in South Vietnam, nor any serious congressional inquiry into our foreign policy in that area. With the notable exception of a handful of reporters, no major organ of the press has seriously questioned U.S. participation in the South Vietnam War. One looks in vain for some thoughtful, thorough evaluation of a situation that may lead us into a police action as devastating as Korea, with its cost of human life and national conscience. This unanimous silence is new, even for the period of the Cold War. On April 6, 1954, when the United States was moving toward participation with atomic weapons in Vietnam, a young senator from Massachusetts addressed the United States Congress with these words. The time has come for the American people to be told the blunt truth about Indochina, but the speeches of President Eisenhower, Secretary Dulles, and others have left too much unsaid in my opinion. And what has been left unsaid is the heart of the problem that should concern every citizen. For if the American people are, for the fourth time in this century, to travel a long and torturous road of war, particularly a war which we now realize would threaten the survival of civilization, then I believe we have a right, a right which we should have hitherto exercised to inquire in detail into the nature of the struggle in which we may become engaged and the alternative to that struggle. To pour in money, material, and men into the jungles of Indochina without at least a remote prospect of victory would be dangerously futile and self-destructive. I am frankly of the belief that no amount of American military assistance in Indochina can conquer an enemy which is everywhere and at the same time nowhere, an enemy of the people, which has the sympathy and covert support of the people. The facts and alternatives before us are unpleasant, but in a nation such as ours, it is only through the fullest and frankest appreciation of such facts and alternatives that any foreign policy can be effectively maintained. In an era of supersonic attack and atomic retaliation, extended public debate and education are of no avail once such a policy must be implemented. The time to study, to doubt, to review and revise is now, for upon our decisions now may well rest the peace and security of the world, and indeed the very continued existence of mankind. The young senator is now, of course, our young president, John F. Kennedy. And yet now, eight years later, not even our peace candidates feel themselves able to challenge American action in South Vietnam. As a consequence, there is no debate of the possibility of a coming war, and equally seriously, there is little information on which to base debate. In attempting to prepare this series of broadcasts on South Vietnam, Mrs. Plosser and myself read extensively from available Western sources, but large gaps of information remain and listeners will find that they must repeatedly engage in their own speculations. Our own resources here were simply insufficient to carry out the kind of research really needed. What is needed is a wide public debate which would engage political opposition and challenge official interpretation. A sense of the government's attitude toward accurate information and evaluation of the South Vietnam War may be gotten from several quotes from a recent State Department publication. The publication was based on an address by the Under Secretary of State George Ball. He was speaking before the Economic Club of Detroit on April 30, 1962. It begins, Vietnam is one of the world's danger spots where a valiant people are struggling to defend their freedom. We Americans are assisting them in this struggle. The free Vietnamese have a determined and resourceful leader who is today the President of the Republic, Nodim Diem. The pamphlet ends, 
It will take effort to defeat this insurgency in Vietnam. Most of all, it will take the patient application of effort over a long period of time. But the Vietnamese people are sturdy and resilient, and they have the will to win. No reporter on the scene in South Vietnam today is quite so confident, quite so complimentary of President Diem, quite so optimistic about the will of the South Vietnamese people. Homer Biggert, who recently returned from South Vietnam after spending six months there, began an article in the New York Times recently. The United States, by massive and unqualified support of the regime of President Ngo Dinh Diem, has helped arrest the spread of communist insurgency in South Vietnam. But victory is remote. The issue remains in doubt because the Vietnamese president seems incapable of winning the loyalty of his people. Yet the administration policy toward South Vietnam remains largely undiscussed and the precise nature of this policy and of its consequences remains largely unknown to the United States public. Even those few reporters who attempt serious investigation find it almost impossible to do their job. By the first of this year, 1962, reporters were complaining of new censorship and suppression imposed both by the South Vietnam government and the U.S. assistance forces. Roy Essoyan of the Associated Press complained that reporters had not been allowed to accompany U.S. troops on their missions. Newsweek's reporter in the area, Francis Sully, cabled his home office, a decision suppressing all information on American activities in Vietnam has denied basic news. Sully was, incidentally, later expelled from the country. Homer Biggert of the New York Times cabled when he first arrived in South Vietnam, official secrecy has curbed reporting. And Newsweek magazine commented, The United States information policy on Vietnam has not been marked by candor. These complaints were all voiced around the first of the year, yet no storm was created and no new action was taken. If anything, news seems less complete and more conjectural now than ever. Jack Fossey, a correspondent on the staff of the San Francisco Chronicle, who recently returned from an assignment in South Vietnam, wrote in his return, In what amounts to a covert agreement, United States military diplomats and officials of the Republic of Vietnam are providing correspondence only with the most meager information on American participation in the counter-guerrilla war against the Viet Cong communists. Fossey then goes on to say that even Secretary of Defense McNamara has had information withheld from him, and he accused U.S. military spokesmen of resorting to outright falsehoods. At one point, Fossey writes, But perhaps the most provoking restriction are those on specifically U.S. military operations. For example, American naval vessels are assisting Vietnam patrol boats in stopping communist junks off the coast. Yet not one correspondent has been able, to my knowledge, to accompany such ships on their patrols. And Homer Biggert wrote in May in the New York Times house organ, Saigon is a nice place to spend a few days in. The food and wine are good, the city is attractive, most hotels and restaurants are air-conditioned. But to work here is peculiarly depressing. Too often correspondents are regarded by the American mission as tools of foreign policy. Those who balk are apt to find it a bit lonely, and they are likely to be distrusted and shunned by American and Vietnamese officials. I am sick of it. Increasingly, we have been told by our officials that the war in South Vietnam is progressing well, that slowly but surely the Viet Cong are being defeated. Yet scattered reports continue of fighting in the suburbs of Saigon itself, and apparently the countryside is completely controlled by the Viet Cong. Increasingly, too, are reports of the Vietnamese people's disaffection with the Diem government, and, of course, the country that keeps that government in power, the United States. We have poured well over $2 billion into South Vietnam in the past seven years. We have committed at least 10,000 U.S. troops to the area. We are in the process of building up a South Vietnam army of 350,000 men, armed with all the weapons of modern war except atomic ones, including, however, chemicals for crop destruction and defoliation. The enemy is reported to be 25,000 irregular, ill-armed Viet Cong guerrillas. Yet we have not won. Why? In the series of six programs which this broadcast is introducing, we hope to give some of the background that may help to explain this unanswered question. 
The series will deal with Vietnamese history, with the background of the current national leaders, with the country and with the economy. It is based on what material was available to us from standard Western sources. When the series was originally planned, we had little reliable information on North Vietnam. Since that time, more has come to our attention, and we have attempted to integrate it into the original framework. As one would expect, the information on North Vietnam is most suspect, most contradictory, and probably least reliable. North Vietnam has had no Edgar Snow or Herbert Matthews to travel into its backlands and talk with its leaders. The same problem really pervades all the information on Vietnam as well, however. Figures, reports, and impressions are frequently contradictory. In the last of these programs, when we deal with the International Control Commission and its attempt to collect information, some of these problems will become still clearer. We know also that this is a large bulk of material, difficult to assimilate through broadcast. The three major sections will be the middle three, dealing with the character of the Diem government, the resistance to that government, and United States participation in Vietnam. We feel also that there is a certain urgency in getting this information before you. The future course of the Vietnamese war is very much in doubt. It does not yet involve open hostilities between the North and South, and yet, like Korea, it could come to do so. Some 9,000 Vietnamese are dying each month. The South Vietnamese government claims that northern troops are being sent to fight in the South. And U.S. News & World Report wrote some time ago, Americans are training South Vietnamese special forces to carry guerrilla raids into North Vietnam. With this role for U.S. troops, and with a large American presence in South Vietnam, any North-South war would surely become an international one. As John F. Kennedy told Congress eight years ago, the time to study, to doubt, to review and revise is now. In the eight years since then, there has been no real study, no review, and certainly no revision of our policies. And hence, such discussions seem still more urgent today. Stretching along the eastern limits of the Southeast Asian Peninsula is Vietnam. It is bounded, with few exceptions, either by mountains or by water. To the east is the South China Sea. The northern and western boundaries of China, Laos, and Cambodia, respectively, are marked by rugged mountains which reach to heights of 8,000 feet. The southern boundary between Cambodia and Vietnam is the exception. It runs along a densely populated, cultivated lowland. The picturesque characterization of Vietnam as two bags of rice hanging from the two ends of a yoke aptly summarizes the salient features of both its geography and its economy. This image refers to the two great river deltas of the Red River in the north and the Mekong River in the south, the rice bags, and the Annamite mountain chain, the yoke. Since 1954, the two rice bags have been separated by an armistice line running approximately along the 17th parallel. North of this line is the People's Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and south of the line is the Republic of Vietnam. The total land area of both areas, Vietnam, is approximately 126,000 square miles, or somewhat larger than the state of New Mexico and smaller than the state of California. Of this total area, 65,700 comprises South Vietnam, and 50,900 square miles makes up the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. While the southern half has the biggest area, it has the smallest population, 12 million. The north has approximately 14,600,000 persons. The rugged, jungle-covered, fever-ridden highlands and mountains account for about 85% of Vietnam's land surface. But these areas are sparsely inhabited by small hill tribes. The bulk of the population lives in the remaining 15% of the land or the two rice bags, the lowlands of the Red River and the Mekong River. The lowland of the Red River in the north is called Tonkin. The deltaic plains of the Mekong River in the south are called Cochin, China. The Tonkin lowland is smaller, 6,000 square miles, supporting a larger population. It has an average density of 1,250 people per square mile. The Mekong Delta covers some 14,000 square miles and has an average population density of 250 people per square mile. 
Hanoi is the center of the Tonkin Delta and the capital city of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Saigon is the biggest city of the Mekong Delta and is the capital of the Republic of Vietnam. Most of the permanently occupied portion of Vietnam is devoted to agricultural uses. Cultivation of wet rice accounts for about 87% of all the cultivated area. The rice region of North Vietnam, or the Tonkin Delta, represents one of the Earth's most densely populated areas. Densities of 1,500 people per square mile were recorded in the rice growing areas of North Vietnam in early 1950. Historically, northern Vietnam has been rice deficient, relying on imports from Cochin, China to supplement shortages. The southern rice region of Cochin, China differs markedly from the northern region. It is relatively sparsely populated with densities of 100 to 450 per square mile. It has been historically a great surplus rice region, where before World War II, 750,000 tons of rice were produced each year for export. Northern Vietnam has always led southern Vietnam in non-agricultural resources and their utilization. Almost half of Vietnam is covered with forests. Except for fuel wood, these forests have been little touched, however, and during the French colonial period, wood for construction or paper was actually imported. Hydroelectric resources are for all practical purposes unexploited, although Vietnam has one of Asia's biggest hydroelectric potentials. Mineralogical exploration has been retarded, thus any generalizations about Vietnam's mineral resources are subject to modification by recent discoveries. The major mineral resources are located in northern Vietnam. The most important of these minerals is coal. Most of the coal is a relatively high-grade anthracite and reserves are estimated as high as 20 billion tons, roughly comparable to those of Japan. Tin and zinc are mined in the highlands of northern Vietnam. Salt, gold, iron, wolfram, and antimony ores have been mined in Tonkin, but their production has been small and the dimensions of the deposits are not known. Prior to 1954, the northern and southern regions of Vietnam were complementary in resources and production, with products of northern industry exchanged for southern rice. Under colonial rule, Vietnam's limited industrial capacity was concentrated in the north, and with partition, most of this same industry remained in the north. In the south, industry is based on processing agricultural products. In the north, industrial output is more securely based on the processing of minerals, manufacturing of machinery and tools, as well as the processing of agricultural products. During their early history, the Vietnamese were restricted to the northern areas of Tonkin. Nam Viet, the first Vietnamese kingdom, founded around 208 BC, forged together parts of what is now southern China, Tonkin, and northern Annam. This was incorporated into China proper in 111 BC and remained a part of China for over 1,000 years. During this thousand years, the basic Vietnamese society was overlain by various aspects of the Chinese culture, probably the most important of these being the political and social organization of the Mandarinate and the moral precepts embodied in Confucianism. Vietnam's independence from China was gained in 939 AD at which time Vietnam began expanding. By the middle of the 1700s, the Vietnamese had moved southward and westward to their farthest limits, ruling an area approximately that of present-day Vietnam. Vietnam's growth occurred at the same time that European powers were expanding. Although early French influence in Indochina began much earlier with Catholic missionaries, the first French territorial acquisition in Indochina was in 1857 when France took the port of Huron. By August 25, 1883, Vietnamese independence ended. Cochin, China became a French colony, and Tonkin and Annam became protectorates. As a source of income for metropolitan France, Vietnam's economy was dominated by a combination of French investors and the Banque de l'Indochine. France had almost exclusive control over mineral extraction, the rubber industry, and manufacturing. The Chinese controlled the rice trade. The French created, by drainage, clearing, irrigation, and dikes, thousands of acres of new farmland. They built roads, hospitals, railroads, and remodeled Saigon after Paris. They introduced new crops and rubber. A well-known French writer, Roland Dogel, wrote in 1925, Less than 40 years ago, there was not a rubber tree in the colony. Today, rubber trees can be counted by the millions on immense plantations. 
This was accomplished despite sickness, despite the flight of coolies, despite storms which ruined roads, despite everything. Miserable lands which were not worth a piastre bring fortunes. France constructed over 3,000 kilometers of railroads, connecting Indochina with China, 32,000 kilometers of roads, 3,000 kilometers of canals, 16,000 kilometers of telephone lines. It increased rice production, increased coal production, helped stop land erosion, and built many reservoirs and dikes. While such progress flourished, however, the peasant labored under a grinding burden of debt. The Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, William O. Douglas, has written, The people of Indochina got only the crumbs, the French the feast. France imposed a preferential tariff on Indochina, curtailing any trade between Indochina and the lower-priced markets of Asia. While the natural resources were mined and exported, few factories were built in Vietnam or the other portions of Indochina. It was also French policy to create dummy corporations that would lay claims to the wealth of Vietnam against the days when the riches might be developed through concessions or otherwise. The peasant was tied to the landlord and the usurer. The French made one attempt to alleviate the dependence of the peasant on the usurer by giving credit to the large landowners in order that the latter could extend credit to the peasants. But much of the credit which was made available to the landowners was only relent to the peasants at exorbitant rates. Enlarging on this situation, Ellen J. Hammer writes, The Cochin Chinese landlord often collected more in usury than he did in rent. The abundant benefits of usury combined with the French practice of granting extensive concessions in underdeveloped land to French companies and rich Vietnamese led to the development of many large estates owned by absentee landlords. These estates were worked by tenant farmers. These tenants, or sharecroppers, worked between 60 and 80 percent of the Cochin farmland, and he generally had to give far more than half his annual harvest to his landlord. Similar details regarding the laborer are given by Virginia Thompson in Notes of Labor Problems in Indochina. The laborer is chronically oppressed. Even during the best years, he could save nothing. The average income of the Vietnamese laborer prior to World War II was 49 piastres a year. He lived from day to day, ate well only at harvest time, and eked out a bare existence. Prior to the French economy, the indigenous economy was based primarily upon a communal system. The communal villages supplemented agriculture by artisan activities. These were villages of weavers, of distillers, of carpenters and the like. These were largely wiped out by the French through protective tariffs and other devices. The ownership and distribution of the cultivable land tells more of the story. About 95 percent of all owners of rice paddies owned about 29 percent of the rice paddies. Slightly over 5 percent owned about 60 percent of the rice paddies. The 95 percent owned on the average of 1.73 acres per proprietor visualize an acre as the area of a football field plus the end zones, while 60 percent owned less than one acre. These people for years did not make enough to satisfy their hunger. In southern Vietnam alone, 200,000 landless families worked as sharecroppers. In Tonkin, 62 percent of the peasantry eventually owned less than nine-tenths of an acre and 30 percent less than four-tenths of an acre. Conditions in Anam were only slightly better. In South Vietnam, the pattern of agricultural settlement was that of the large estates. These were owned by French and Vietnamese landlords. Of this land, three-quarters was owned by absentee landlords. The rubber industry, the main base for the estate pattern, brought a rubber boom, but no workers were available to keep up the production demanded. Thousands from Tonkin were brought to work in the rubber plantations and shipyards under conditions approximating peonage. The peasant could no longer turn to his commune for help. Many of the communal lands were lost at a time when they were more desperately needed than ever, the result of population increases and of the breakdown of village authority. Speculation and corruption reduced the communal lands to one-fifth the total cultivated area in Tonkin, one-quarter in Anam, and a meager three percent in Cochin, China. The French brought more than an economic and political structure to Indochina. Perpetuation of the Vietnamese culture was not encouraged by the French. The Vietnamese were colonial people and given a second-class citizenship. Before the French came, Vietnam had a school of advanced learning in each province and district,
with public examinations for degrees. The French abolished this system and set up their own schools. They established libraries, research centers, technical schools, and a university at Hanoi, but these institutions were not generally for the Vietnamese. Elementary education was available for only 2% of the people. The French created no elementary schools for the Vietnamese until 1919, and then they made them available for less than 1% of the population. Over 60% of the population was completely illiterate. Only the lower government posts were open to the Vietnamese, and then only to those few who had become French citizens. All political organizations were suppressed. Books and pamphlets, often seen freely in Paris, were unlawful. Free speech and civil liberties were denied to natives. Early Vietnamese resistance to colonial rule was concerned with removing the French and restoring the Nguyen dynasty. The earliest nationalist leaders were Mandarins, for the most part, and members of the royal family. In 1911, when the Chinese Revolution overthrew the Manchu dynasty, Vietnamese nationalists began looking toward the Kuomintang as a model for revolution. The basis for a nationalist revolution gradually changed from that of restoring the old dynasty to one with a broader political and social base. During World War I, France, locked in battle with Germany, turned to her colonies for support, and some 100,000 Vietnamese soldiers and workers were sent to Europe. For the first time, large numbers of Vietnamese were exposed to the ideas of political and social equality. One of these was Ho Chi Minh, and in our next program, we will trace his remarkable career. Ho Chi Minh was born in 1890 or 1892 in Kim Lien in Annam. His real name was Nguyen Van Tam, and he was the son of a poor native prefect. In 1911, after having attended high school in Hue, Ho left his home and shipped as a cabin boy aboard a vessel bound for France. For the next three years he travelled around the world, usually as a cook's helper, and managed in his spare time to read as much as he could, ranging from Shakespeare to Tolstoy to Marx. His travels also helped develop his linguistic talents. He now speaks French, English, Russian, German, Czech, Japanese, and three Chinese and various Annamese dialects. In 1914, he debarked at Le Havre and was then using the name Nguyen I Kwok, Nguyen the Patriot. He went to London, where he joined a revolutionary Vietnamese group called the Overseas Workers. He stoked furnaces and did other menial jobs for a living, and for a time he worked in the Carlton Hotel kitchen as a dishwasher. During the First World War, he turned up in Paris, and after studying photography, set himself up in a tiny Montmartre room and studio, advertising good portraits, handsome frames, for 45 francs. He joined the French Socialist Party, wrote articles for the newspaper Le Populaire, joined small cultural clubs, political groups, and study organizations. Wearing a rented dress suit, Ho showed up at the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919, seeking to deliver an appeal for Vietnamese freedom, but he was not accorded a hearing. In 1920, the French Socialist Party split. Ho was with the group that formed the French Communist Party. In 1922, Ho made his first trip to Moscow to attend the International School of Marxism. In 1923, he went to Moscow as the French delegate to the Congress of the Peasant International. In 1925, he went with Mikhail Borodin, the top Soviet advisor to the Kuomintang, to Canton, where he worked as a translator in the Soviet embassy. That same year, Ho organized the Association of Vietnamese Revolutionary Youth, which became the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, or the ICP, in 1930. The ICP was a latecomer in the nationalist camp, and at this time, its membership did not exceed a few hundred. The major nationalist group, the Vietnamese Nationalist Party, or Viet Nam Quoc Dan Dang, was organized in 1927 and followed the lines of the Chinese Kuomintang. The Viet Nam Quoc Dan Dang, or VNQDD, decided on an all-out revolutionary effort against the French, and on February 9, 1930, the Vietnamese garrison at Yen Bay revolted. The French response was immediate and effective, 
and the VNQDD was virtually destroyed until it reappeared under nationalist Chinese auspices after World War II. During the years that the VNQDD had been the leader of the nationalist efforts in Vietnam, the Indochina Communist Party and Ho Chi Minh were spreading propaganda, fighting internal arguments, and seeking common term recognition. After the defeat of the VNQDD in 1930, the ICP began leading the nationalist movement. They staged a series of demonstrations, led strikes, and backed a peasants' rebellion in two provinces in 1930. ICP membership grew to about 1,500 in 1931 and was augmented by some 100,000 peasants affiliated in peasant organizations. Later, when the Trotskyists became strong in the southern portion of Vietnam, the ICP lost ground. In mid-1931, Ho Chi Minh was arrested in Hong Kong and was imprisoned for 18 months. During his imprisonment, he nearly died of tuberculosis. After his release, Ho returned secretly to Vietnam. In 1938, he, as well as the ICP, was driven underground by the French. The world was on the verge of the Second World War. Japan needed Indochina as a base for military campaigns to the south and as a source of supplies, rice, rubber, and coal for the home islands. When the Japanese entered into China in 1940, the Vietnamese prepared to resist. The French, however, under the Vichy government, made a pact with the Japanese whereby the Japanese guaranteed French sovereignty in Vietnam and the French agreed to furnish the Japanese with transport, food, and other supplies needed for their war against China. The French and the Japanese then brought their combined forces against the guerrillas inside Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh organized the Vietnam Independence League in May 1941. This league was called Viet Minh. Fearing the strength of the Viet Minh, the Chinese arrested Ho in 1942. They organized the Vietnam Revolutionary League to counteract the Viet Minh. Ho, as Secretary General of the Viet Minh, recognized the Revolutionary League, and when the latter failed at Japanese resistance in 1943, Ho was released. He went to Kunming and made contact with the Allies, created the Army of Liberation, and began intelligence and guerrilla warfare against the Japanese. The U.S. Office of Secret Service, the OSS, dropped supplies and ammunition to help the Army of Liberation carry on their warfare against the Japanese. During these years, Ho Chi Minh expanded and consolidated his holdings primarily in the north. The Viet Minh met resistance in the south not only from the French but from the Cao Dai, a religious sect which had collaborated with the Japanese, the Hao Hao, another religious sect which was independently fighting the French, and the Trotskyists, who had opposed the ICP. On March 11, 1945, the Japanese, sensing disaster, proclaimed Vietnam independent from the French, but not from the Japanese, and put Bao Dai in control as emperor. The Viet Minh refused to recognize the Bao Dai government. Still strong in North Vietnam, with some 10,000 troops in control of the rural areas, Ho Chi Minh called for a general insurrection in August 1945. Bao Dai abdicated, and the pro-Japanese government resigned. On August 25, 1945, Ho Chi Minh proclaimed the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and made Bao Dai his supreme advisor. A week later, on September 2, 1945, before a crowd assembled in Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh read the Declaration of Independence of Vietnam, which began, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with a certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It then paraphrased the French Declaration of the Rights of Man of 1789, proclaiming that, Every man is born equal and enjoys free and equal rights, and it proclaimed the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples sponsored by the United Nations. In order to counteract their weak position in the South, the Viet Minh organized the Committee for the South to consolidate their control. 
This they started to do, first at the expense of the Trotskyists, member of whom were assassinated, or, by one means or another, removed from the scene. Beyond this initial step, the Viet Minh were halted by the implementation of the decisions arrived at at the Potsdam Conference. Although Vietnam argued that France had abdicated its right to rule Vietnam when she refused to defend Vietnam against the Japanese, the agreements at the Potsdam Conference upheld France. Accordingly, all of Southeast Asia was in the British sphere of influence. The British were to occupy Indochina up to the 16th parallel and the Chinese above it. They were to restore law and order and accept the Japanese surrender in their respective zones. In the South, the British arrived under General Gracie. His specific orders from Vice Admiral Mountbatten read, Do not get involved in maintaining order. But Gracie's first proclamation of September 20th, 1945, was responsibility for maintaining order. He ordered, one, a ban on the Vietnamese press, two, a ban on meetings and demonstrations, three, a strict curfew, and four, proclaim martial law. On September 22nd, the British armed over 1,000 French troops and a contingent of French paratroopers. They executed a coup, taking Cochin, China, from the Committee of the South, and then, in the words of one author, vented their accumulation of anger against Vietnamese in a wave of violence, unchecked by French or British. A truce, signed on October 1st, 1945, ended a short ten days later, when the French would not accept Vietnamese independence and the Vietnamese would not accept French rule. The Japanese were rearmed and used to help the French restore law and order. Not until the Japanese had helped the British restore southern Vietnam did the Japanese disarmament start. By December 1945, the French had over 60,000 troops south of the 16th parallel and were ready to complete the pacification of the country. In the meantime, the Chinese had arrived in the north. With the Chinese nationalists came the members of the Revolutionary League and exiled members of the defunct VNQDD. Operating under an umbrella of Chinese protection, these organizations were soon established in several strategic areas competing with the Viet Minh. Even so, an election was held in January 1946, in which 80% of the men and women over 18 years of age voted. Minority parties won some seats in the parliament, but the overwhelming majority of seats were won by the Viet Minh. Ho Chi Minh was elected president. However, the Chinese nationalists were in sufficient control to force Ho to include pro Kuomintang people on his staff. Ho then began to implement a broad program of social reforms. The program contained the abolition of absentee landlordism and usury, the guarantee of a living wage, the production of enough rice and clothing to provide each citizen with his bare needs, the teaching of everyone how to read and write, guarantees of democratic liberties, the abolition of the head tax, and equal rights for minorities and women. Very little information is available on the actual accomplishments of Ho's short-lived government. Apparently, a program of education was begun, some crop diversification was started, dikes and irrigation canals destroyed in the wars and floods of 1944 and 45 were repaired, and some land distribution was initiated. Ho seems to have had the support of most Vietnamese within his control. The Chinese agreed to leave Vietnam in the spring of 1946, after gaining numerous concessions from the French. The Viet Minh, unable to withstand a French return, without Chinese support, entered into negotiations with the French. In March 1946, an agreement was reached. The French, represented by Commissioner Jean Santigny, agreed to recognize the Democratic Republic of Vietnam as a free state having its own government, parliament, army and treasury belonging to the Indochinese Federation and the French Union. The French further agreed to a referendum to determine whether Tonkin, Annam and Cochin, China should be united and to a gradual withdrawal of French troops. 
The Democratic Republic of Vietnam, represented by Ho Chi Minh and Vu Hon Khan, a member of the VNQDD, agreed not to oppose French forces sent to relieve the Chinese in Hanoi, and they agreed that details of implementation would be negotiated at a later date. Jean Santani, Ho Chi Minh, and the VNQDD representative were all respectively attacked for the agreement. Santani was criticized for opening the way for Vietnamese independence. In the north, Ho had to use force to secure Vietnamese compliance. It was felt there that the agreement was a diplomatic victory for France, since it ensured the French a return to Hanoi and prolonged negotiations until after the French were in control of Hanoi. In an announced attempt to speed up the negotiations, Ho called for a meeting to iron out details for implementation in April 1946 at Delat. The conference failed over what defined a free state and when a referendum would be held. In an announced attempt to speed up the negotiations, Ho called for a meeting to iron out details for implementation in April 1946 at Delat. The conference failed over what defined a free state and when a referendum would be held. Ho was invited to Paris for further talks. The meeting, which took place at Fontainebleau in June 1946, was doomed to failure. While Ho was en route to the meeting, Admiral Dajonlou, the French High Commissioner, in violation of the March 6th Agreement, proclaimed South Vietnam as the Federation of Cochin, China. Ho Chi Minh had to return to Vietnam on a French warship. Under the pressure of those circumstances, he agreed to accept piastres issued by the French Bank of Indochina as legal tender, which meant that Ho, who had already issued his own money, would no longer be able to control his own finances. He also agreed to a general formula for a customs union. Thus, he would not be able to export goods, and even if he wanted to, the French would have a fleet which stood guard at the ports. The Viet Minh opposed the French when they proceeded to take over the port of Hai Phong. Twenty French casualties were recorded. The next day, November 22, 1946, the French bombarded the Vietnamese quarter of the city, killing more than 6,000 people. The French ordered the Viet Minh to disarm, and on December 19th, the Vietnamese answered by attacking French positions in Hanoi. Fighting soon spread. Ho Chi Minh fled to the hills with his troops, and the French-Indochina War began. The fighting lasted for seven and a half years. The French could not withstand the tactics of guerrilla warfare, and the Vietnamese could not muster enough military strength to remove the French from Vietnam. In an effort to find an alternative to the Viet Minh, the French persuaded Bao Dai, then living in Hong Kong, to enter politics in late 1947. After disagreements as to the degree of independence to be granted to Vietnam, Bao Dai and the French signed an agreement, the Elysee Accord, in June 1949. By the agreement, Tonkin, Annam and Cochin, China were unified under Bao Dai and would join the French Union as an associated state. The French remained in large cities, however, French nationals had privileged legal status, and the fiscal policies remained in French hands. The Bao Dai solution failed to gain support among Vietnamese nationalists. In the North, the Communist Party, the ICP, was revived in 1951, and the Viet Minh began receiving aid from the Chinese Communists. At about this same time, the Truman Containment Policy was formulated, and the United States began sending aid to the French. With these moves, the war in Indochina ceased to be regarded as a nationalist move, but a Cold War issue. By 1953, after three years of aid, the United States was paying about 80% of French costs, or about $500 million annually. In March 1954, the French requested direct U.S. military intervention as the situation in Tonkin worsened. On Saturday, April 3, 1954, a conference of five senators and three representatives
was held with the then Secretary of State John F. Dulles. What was wanted was a joint resolution by Congress to permit the President to use air and naval power in Indochina. Faced with opposition from most of the members present, among them Lyndon Johnson, Richard Russell, Errol Clements, Joseph Martin, John McCormick and Percy Priest, all eight members of the conference and Dulles agreed that before such a resolution would be presented to Congress, joint support from our allies would be needed. Such support was not forthcoming and was in fact strongly opposed by Great Britain. This brief incident is interesting in what it indicates about U.S. participation in Indochina. Chalmers Roberts discussed the incident in the Reporter magazine in September of 1954. At the April 3rd meeting, the military plan was outlined by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Arthur Radford. Radford's plan called for some 200 planes from the 31,000-ton U.S. Navy carriers, the Essex and Boxer, then in the South China Sea ostensibly for training, plus land-based U.S. Air Force planes to be used for a single strike to save Tian Ben Fu. When Radford was asked what course would be followed if the airstrike failed, he indicated that the U.S. forces would follow up, but Radford would not elaborate. The congressman asked Radford if the plan had the support of the other chiefs of staff, and uh, he replied that it did not. When asked to explain this, he said that the other chiefs of staff did not understand the situation in Asia as well as he did. Lyndon Johnson asked Secretary Dulles if any other nation had agreed to send troops to Indochina. Dulles said that no other nations had been asked to participate. What Dulles specifically wanted was as a resolution by Congress which would permit the President to use air and naval power in Indochina. Dulles began negotiations with her allies particularly the British. He was unsuccessful. Foreign Secretary Eden said that he would not agree to any such scheme on intervention, that he was personally opposed to it. He added his conviction that within 48 hours after an airstrike, ground troops would be needed, as had been the case at the beginning of the Korean War. Eden, however, flew to London and convened a special cabinet session. The Geneva Conference on in Indochina was to open on April 26th. On April 24th, Eden arrived in Geneva with a specific mandate from his cabinet to avoid entry into the Indochina War. Prime Minister Churchill announced to a cheering House of Commons that the British government was not prepared to give any undertakings about United Kingdom military action in Indochina in advance of the results of Geneva. And he added, we have not entered into any new political or military commitments. The strong fortified French fort, Dien Bien Phu, fell on May 7, 1954. Nothing stood in the way of a Viet Minh advance toward Hanoi and Haiphong. Yet, with strong Russian and Chinese insistence, the Viet Minh agreed to negotiate. Final agreement was reached on the night of July 20th and 21st, 1954. The Geneva Agreement dealt with all of former French Indochina, Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam. The part dealing with Vietnam was agreed to by the French and the De Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The French Union forces were to implement the articles in the southern part of Vietnam and the People's Army of Vietnam were to implement the agreement in the northern part. The main points of the Geneva Agreement affecting Vietnam were partition of Vietnam at the 17th parallel, staged withdrawal of all troops to their respective zones to be completed within 300 days, military equipment to enter Vietnam only on a replacement basis and troops only on a rotation basis, free movement of civilians between the two zones until the end of the 300-day troop evacuation period, each party was to guarantee democratic liberties and to refrain from reprisals or discriminations against persons involved in the hostilities. National elections were to be held within two years of the agreement to unify the northern and southern zones. An international armistice commission composed of representatives of India,
Canada and Poland, and chaired by India, was established to supervise the agreements. The key to the Geneva Accords was Viet Minh's insistence on elections to unify the country. Philip de Villiers, a French scholar and writer who lived in Vietnam during the Indochina War, and who has written a standard volume on the early stages of that war, wrote, During the conference, French diplomatic strategy, with reference to elections, had been wholly inspired by the idea that if the elections took place quickly, while the effects of what appeared to be a great success for the Viet Minh were still apparent, Ho Chi Minh and his followers would emerge triumphant. On the other hand, given a reasonable delay, the prestige of the resistance would have waned, the people given time to recover would be more aware of their best interest, more conscious of ideological affinities and an atmosphere of freedom, thus providing an opportunity for the non-Marxist parties to step in. He continued, The majority of Western observers had undoubtedly few illusions about the non-Marxist chances of recovery. Their political ideology was of the vaguest, and they had practically no contact with the people. The disproportion between the monolithic power of the Viet Minh, armed and with the halo of victory, and the almost derisory weakness of the so-called nationalist Vietnam was such that in the summer of 1954 almost no one thought that the two years' delay won by Mondes France at Geneva could be anything but a respite in which to salvage as much as possible from the wreck. At the end of the period, unity would certainly be restored, this time to the benefit of the Viet Minh. U.S. Under Secretary of State Walter Biddle Smith commented on the conclusion of the conference, I would like to point out that when we analyse and discuss the results of Geneva, it will be well to remember that diplomacy has rarely been able to gain at the conference table what cannot be gained or held on the battlefield. However, although the accords seemed favourable to the Viet Minh, the Hanoi government from the very first had serious reservations. For one thing, who could guarantee that the agreements particularly regarding elections, would be respected and implemented. South Vietnam was not a signatory of the Pact at Geneva and declared immediately that it would not be bound by them. The United States, while stating that it would not oppose the agreements, also refused to sign them. And France, who seemed the best hope, rapidly began to withdraw its forces and cease exercising its influence in the area. The actual U.S. announcement on the agreement said in part the United States will refrain from the threat or the use of force to disturb the ceasefire agreements. And specifically, on the question of elections, it said, in the case of nations now divided against their will, we shall continue to seek to achieve unity through free elections supervised by the United Nations to ensure that they are conducted fairly. Secretary Dulles was also less than enthusiastic. He said, we would not seek by force to overthrow the settlement. Hanoi might well have wondered, then, by what means. Dulles continued, The important thing from now on is not to mourn the past, but to seize future opportunities to prevent the loss of North Vietnam from leading to the extension of communism throughout Southeast Asia. Dulles also pointed out two lessons as he saw them. First, Resistance to communism needs popular support. One good aspect of the Geneva Conference, he said, is that it advances the truly independent states of Cambodia, Laos and South Vietnam. These remarks were made on July 23rd. It was already clear that South Vietnam would be regarded by the US as an independent separate country. Dulles, lesson number two, was, we should bear in mind that the problem is not merely one of deterring open, armed aggression, but of preventing communist subversion, which, taking advantage of economic dislocations and social injustice, might weaken and finally overthrow the non-communist government of South Vietnam. The Soviet Union and China, who responded to the accords with enthusiasm, stressed the provisions provided for elections. Pravda wrote on July 22nd, the provisions for an accurately defined time for the general elections in Vietnam is of enormous political importance. It is known that this decision was adopted 
as a result of the protracted and determined struggle of the representatives of the USSR, the China People's Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The American aggressive circles, striving to split Vietnam finally, have suffered a defeat. The actual implementation of the Geneva Accords will be dealt with in detail in the last program of this series on the International Control Commission. The primary question at this point was whether or not Dulles would be able to implement his two lessons. First, that South Vietnam be made a truly independent state based on popular support, and secondly, that the problem would not be one of deterring open armed aggression, but of halting subversion which took advantage of economic dislocation and social injustice. In short, what was the character of the new South Vietnam government to be? This will be the topic of our next report. As we said in our last broadcast, Bao Dai, the emperor of South Vietnam, did not sign the Geneva Agreements and announced that he would not consider himself to be bound by them. In June of 1954, he appointed Ngo Zim Ziem premier. The first task was political unity. Ziem, from the very beginning, had the support of the United States government. As early as October of 1954, he had received a letter of support from President Eisenhower. The situation facing Ngo, however, was chaotic. Two religious sects, the Cao Dai and the Hao Dai, each with their own armies and bureaucracies, were in control of large areas of South Vietnam. In Saigon, Bao Dai had sold control of the police to the Binh Zuen, an army of one-time river pirates who controlled gambling, dope, and prostitution in the capital city. In April of 1955, Ziem was engaged in open fighting between his forces and the Binh Zien, Ziem won. On October 23, 1955, a referendum was held, and, with 98% of the vote, Ngo Zim Ziem became the first president of the Republic of Vietnam. Ziem was immediately faced with three gigantic tasks, creating a viable economy, establishing a trained governmental administration, and maintaining internal security. The entire economy of South Vietnam had been disrupted by the war. Fields were devastated, communications were all but totally destroyed, roads had fallen into disrepair, Railroads, waterways, and bridges, if not destroyed, were practically unusable. Peasants had feared the insecurity of, of the remote villages and had fled to the cities. Partition had brought an end to the historic trade pattern between the North and the South. At the same time, there had been no preparation for self-government. The final withdrawal of French troops had left an administrative vacuum in South Vietnam. All nationalist parties had been suppressed, Diem, upon becoming president, had a bureaucracy dominated by French-selected and trained personnel. We will first turn to the general economy. Since 1954, the United States has poured well over $2 billion into South Vietnam. $50 billion was a loan, the rest was direct aid. France has contributed $2.5 to $3 million. Japan has paid some $54 million in war reparations, West Germany sent a 250,000 technical assistance program. Private U.S. technical programs amount to an estimated $1 million annually. And through the Colombo Plan, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan are also contributing economic assistance. Figures for the latter are lacking, but Australia gives something in the order of over $1 million annually through this plan. Yet with all this aid and much paper planning, in certain major sections, the general economy of South Vietnam is little better than it was in 1939. And if one takes into account the population increase, it may even be worse. At present, it has a trade deficit of $155 million a year, a $5 million increase over last year. Vietnam, south of the protectorates of Annam and Tong King, an area somewhat smaller than present-day South Vietnam, exported in 1935 to 1939 an average of 1.5 million tons of rice after having covered the North Vietnamese deficit of 250,000 tons. 
South Vietnam was historically been known as an area of rice surplus, and thus the title Rice Bowl of Asia. At no time since 1954 did South Vietnam export more than 200,000 tons, and in 1961-62 it actually imported 50,000 tons of rice from the United States. Rubber constitutes a second backbone of the South Vietnam economy, but the production of rubber is still primarily in the hands of French investors, and rubber profits leave the South for France. Imports show overwhelming stress on consumer goods, and in the words of one author, trifles, while necessities are low on the list. In 1958, South Vietnam imported $34.3 million in textile products, more than the total imports of industrial equipment and machinery put together. Most of the imports fell into the category of luxury items, fashionable dresses, undergarments, wristwatches, motor scooters, and so on. A total of $5 million in fertilizers, insecticides, and seeds, technicians and equipments imported can be compared with $7.8 million for private automobiles. Industrial enterprises are owned or partly owned by the government. This form of government ownership is labeled personalism by DM. Although a few new factories have been established in South Vietnam to offset the loss of industrial North Vietnam, the United Nations Economic Survey reported that the industrial production in South Vietnam is slightly downward with little relief in sight. At the same time, unemployment remains one of the city's worst social problems. South Vietnam is, however, overwhelmingly agricultural. The government's approach to this majority of the population has been threefold. A decree was issued on January in 1955 fixing maximum rents at between 15 to 25 percent of a total crop, the exact amount to be determined by the productivity and improvements made upon the land. Included in these provisions was one calling for contracts between tenants and landlords to enforce the new regulations. By 1957, over 50 percent of the farmers had signed such contracts. Opposition has been shown by landlords, however, who delay the terms of the agreements or simply refuse to carry them out. The former minister of agrarian reform, himself a large landowner, was one of the slowest to, com to comply with the new law. A second measure limited absentee land holdings to approximately 100 hectares. A hectare is 2.471 acres. The idea being to break up the relatively few large land holdings but leave the basic landlord-tenant relationship intact. A third measure was to establish an agrarian credit. By mid-1957, agricultural credit agencies had extended loans totaling over 200 million piastres, most of which went for the development of agricultural lands for refugees from North Vietnam. Although these plans are ambitious and positive, the basic structure of land ownership is much the same as it was under the French. The average holding is approximately 5 hectares, and thus the farmer cultivates approximately 13 acres. While cultivation has expanded, the population increase, naturally and by the addition of some 900,000 refugees, has more than compensated for the expansion. Large-scale discontent continued, and in 1959 the government devised a scheme to pull the peasants together in large prosperity centers, commonly known as agrovilles. The aim was twofold, to establish villages which could be more easily protected and guarded by the army, and to set up marketing cooperatives. A description of them by Stanley Carnot in 1961 says, Flanking a canal for about four miles, it had ample bamboo and thatch houses, each with a large garden. There were ferries to take the farmers to their fields, and in one town there was a power plant and school, a dispensary and a common market. The same author goes on to say, After probing a bit deeper, the entire scheme may be a detriment. The project runs directly counter to the traditional social patterns of the region. The swift, ruthless manner in which the agrovilles were created not only disrupted ancient customs, it also alienated more peasants than it could have ever protected. For one particular agroville, the provincial officer described how he and the army rounded up 20,000 peasants, although they were in the midst of their rice harvest, and put them to work. They were paid nothing and when it was finished, only 6,200 people could be accommodated. Homer Biggert, writing in the July 25th issue of the New York Times of this year, 
writes, The strategic hamlets are ringed with mud walls, moats, and barbed wire. He continues, The object is to isolate the peasants from the communists. While appalled by the dreary regimentation of life in these fortified villages, most Americans are convinced that the strategic hamlet is a part of the answer to the pacification problem. But they hope to persuade the president that forced labor on hamlet defenses is not the way to win the affection of the peasants. Besides urging the government to pay for this labor, workers are not even fed, but must provide their own food, the American mission is trying to channel aid directly to the villages in support of counterinsurgency. Bigert reports that the DM government has prevented this. It is perhaps little wonder to quote again from Bigert that observers of sweeps by the Vietnamese army through the Mekong Delta provinces are often struck by the phenomena of deserted villages. As troops approach, all flee, except a few old men and children. No one offers information, no one hurries to put out flags. Most of the rural area is controlled by the Viet Cong. Diem's general economic program and his attempt to win over the countryside have largely failed. Before moving on, we might take a moment to compare Diem's record with that of North Vietnam. While the North was more heavily industrialized, it was still predominantly an agrarian society, and some nine-tenths of the acreage is devoted to rice production. In 1955, the North Vietnam government set up a national planning board and a central statistical office, and by the end of the year their first major plan was announced. At the time, North Vietnam was suffering from some of the worst weather of the century, and floods and typhoons had destroyed large parts of the rice crop. The national plan allocated 20% of capital investment to agriculture and almost 40% for industrial reconstruction. The emphasis was on industrialization. The government instituted, however, an Agrarian Reform Act. It called for a complete transfer of the land to the farmers to be followed by a gradual socialization or collectivization of agriculture. Much of the terminology, incidentally, and the campaigns of political indoctrination, anti-landlord meetings and public trials were reminiscent of the Chinese communist program in China. While it is almost impossible to separate fact from fancy in much of the writing of North Vietnam, the agricultural program did meet with significant resistance in some areas. In 1956, a peasant revolt broke out in Nê An. It was quickly defeated. In its wake, the agrarian reform program was overhauled and the General Communist Party secretary and deputy minister of agriculture resigned. A three-year plan was announced in 1958. Under it, the socialization of agriculture was resumed. By 1960, some 85% of the farmers had joined low-stage producers' cooperatives and 12% had joined higher-stage cooperatives in which all means of production, including livestock, were pooled and payment was made on the basis of total cooperative income. In 1961, a five-year plan was announced, which is designed to complete the socialization of agriculture and lay the technological and material basis for socialism. It is, of course, too early at this point to have any results of even the first year. This last plan, however, has generally reduced the expectations for agricultural output. While agricultural production has increased in North Vietnam, it did not, in general, reach the expectations of the three-year plan, and rice fell far below the expectations of the 1958 three-year plan. North Vietnam's emphasis has been on industrialization, and here the increased productivity has been impressive. In the words of one Asian specialist, William K., unless anything unforeseen happens, it would be prudent to assume that the country will continue to industrialize at a high rate. And he continues, unless major military operations sap a substantial proportion of North Vietnam's national effort, a degree of industrial progress is likely to be achieved that may well become a more effective means of political penetration in neighboring countries than direct military intervention. We might note finally in this brief comparison of the economies of North and South Vietnam that the total Soviet bloc aid to North Vietnam has been on the order of $900 million as compared with well over $2 billion in Western aid to the South. A Reader's Digest article called DM The Greatest Little Man in Asia. Harper's Magazine carried an uncritical article by Senator Mike Mansfield, which was so full of praise for Diem that Mansfield was called 
Ziem's Godfather by the magazine, and Lyndon Johnson, visiting in Saigon, characterized Vietnam as a bastion of freedom and progress and compared Diem to Winston Churchill. Senator Russell said, The country is positively on the advance in all areas of her life observed by me. It is headed in the right direction. And more recently, we have heard praise from President Kennedy himself. Retired Brigadier General Thomas Phillips, however, writes, Diem operates a police state with secret police harassment, arbitrary arrest and police brutality, political prisons, and economic favoritism. The majority of the articles, books, and newspapers read by us for this report validate, in one way or another, the description given by General Phillips. South Vietnam's written constitution provides for a presidential system of government with a legislative body, but no separate judicial system. Since the government was already an operating institution when the constitution was written, it should be kept in mind that most of the written structure of the government gave legal sanction to what already existed. The executive appoints almost all the members of the government, with the exception of the National Assembly, and he virtually controls all governmental agencies, judicial, economic, military, foreign affairs, education, and so on. In addition, the president may enact legislation by decree while the assembly is in recess, and sign decrees temporarily suspending laws in regions which he has declared to be in a state of emergency. Articles 96 and 98 of the Constitution provide legality to the present political process in the Republic of Vietnam. Article 96 gives the president extraordinary powers for establishing a democratic regime, but Article 98 gives him the power to suspend civil liberties completely. Article 98 was invoked in 1959 and is presently in effect. Since in practice the democratic rights defined in the Constitution do not exist in South Vietnam, there seems little need for a detailed outline of the formal governmental framework. Briefly, the Constitution provides for an elaborate democratic system, a republican form of government, national independence, a Bill of Rights, and unity of North and South Vietnam. In the meantime, the real government is Tsiem and his close associates. Wolf Ladijinsky, Diem's agricultural minister, writes in an article praising Diem and his government, The basic theme of the Constitution is to lodge vast powers for executive leadership and control in the President. Another theme is the freedoms guaranteed to the people. For the time being, the emphasis is on administrative action rather than on the democratic features of the Constitution. According to many writers, elections in South Vietnam are a farce. Frank Child, he returned from Vietnam in the summer of 1961 and for two years there with the Michigan State University Advisory Group, writes, Deputies of the National Assembly, the Saigonese incidentally call them Ziem's trained seals, were hand-picked and gained office in the fraudulent elections of 1959. The presidential election of 1961 was a travesty. Former fiscal advisor to the Vietnamese government, 1959 to 1960, and now a faculty member at Michigan State University, writes, Elections are limited to approved candidates, and opposition candidates are either jailed or discouraged from running. In addition, the elections are so fraudulent, army detachments are rushed to any poll when the issue is in doubt, that President Tsiem probably lost the election because he only received 63% of the votes in Saigon. The National Assembly is a pitiful parody of a parliament, not only a rubber stamp, but one which is self-inking. A description of the 1959 election reads, Opponents of the government's national revolutionary movement were invited to run but hardly had the campaign begun when opposition politicians encountered a variety of obstacles, such as having the wrong stamp or signature on their documents or displaying illegal placards. When election day came, contingents of troops were moved into Saigon, where the opposition was the strongest. The troops were all under orders to vote for the government candidates. Even so, an opponent did win a seat, Harvard-educated Dr. Fan Quang Dong, he was never able to assume it, however, because the government arrested him for such infractions as opening his campaign too early, using unauthorized posters, and making false campaign promises. Dr. Dan was jailed. 
A checklist of the members of the government shows the following. No's brother, Nu, is the principal political advisor of the president and is head of the 70,000 undercover members of the Kan Lao organization. Nu's wife is first lady and leader of the organization of Vietnamese women. Brother No Dim Khan is governor of central Vietnam. Another brother, No Dim Lu Yen, is the ambassador to Washington, Canada, Argentina, and Brazil, and Mrs. Nu's mother represents the Republic of Vietnam in the United Nations. Another brother is the Roman Catholic bishop of Vietnam's top-ranking prelate. Nu is probably the most powerful man aside from Diem. He directs the Can Lao, or the Revolutionary Labor Party. Its members have infiltrated into factories, villages, government offices, army units, schools, and newspapers, where they spend time collecting information about their compatriots. Madame Nu is the first lady and is also quite powerful. Time magazine described her as zealous and sincere in her single-minded belief that only Diem can solve South Vietnam problems. Madame Nu tirelessly preaches the merits of personalism, a mixture of Confucianism, autocracy, and Catholic morality. Madame Nu is the founder and president of the one million member Women's Solidarity Movement. There are considerable reports and some evidence that Diem, Nu, and their close associates have vital and large interests in South Vietnam's economic life. Nu reportedly controls the wood and charcoal trade, for example. Most important, however, is the U.S. aid program, which has poured over $2 billion into the area without major success of any kind. Roy Jumper, in an article entitled Mandarin Bureaucracy and Politics in South Vietnam, writes, The problem of actual graft is accentuated by the widespread belief in its universal practice. Another charge against the royal family is that they favor Catholics. Catholicism was introduced by the French. Most Catholics are members of the educated landholding class. As a group, they form only about 4% of the population of South Vietnam, but this 4% is a powerful minority. Jerry Ross, who is field correspondent for Time magazine at the present time, wrote in The New Republic, No visitor can help but be struck by the well-being of the priesthood and the new church in almost every village. For a population over 80% Buddhist, this religious favoritism is a bit difficult to swallow. No, Dzim Ziem himself characterizes his government. His popularity with the villagers is notably lacking. He frequently visits villages in a long black limousine, flanked by Western officials and foreign advisors, and dressed in a shark-skin suit of the French cologne. He is also seen frequently robed in the blue satin tunic and black turban of the imperial mandarin. The press in South Vietnam also remains under tight control. An American publicity firm was hired to polish up the public image of President Ngo under the new government, public relations policy that permitted more freedom of press to correspondence. Newspapers which publish non-flattering stories are not only subject to being closed, but the editors are more likely sent to political re-education camps. Reports which estimate how many such camps exist and how many persons are in them vary. Yung Sang Thong, a Yale University language professor, estimates that there are about 12 such camps with a total enrollment of between 25,000 and 42,000. Tokashi Oka estimates that there are about 40,000 political prisoners. Time magazine cites 30,000 in May of 1962, but the State Department testimony in 1958, before large-scale Viet Cong activity, estimated that 38,000 persons were in South Vietnamese concentration camps. Travel within South Vietnam is allowed only by a permit. Even DM's army is under rigid control. According to Homer Biggert, the army is being expanded by the addition of two new divisions to more than 205,000 men. In addition, the Civil Guard will be expanded by 72,000 men and the Civil Defense Corps by 80,000. Thus, by 1963, DM will have an armed forces totaling more than 350,000 men. They will be armed with more helicopters, armored personnel carriers, and, according to Biggert, with other gadgets to enhance mobility, more sentry dogs to sniff out guerrillas, more plastic boats for the Delta region, 
more American advisers with fresh, new tactical doctrines. The armed forces are now, and will be increasingly in the future, a major force in South Vietnam. Dissidents within the armed forces have tried at least one rebellion, and Diem's control of them is crucial. On September 4, 1961, Frank Child wrote, All but the most minor military command appointments are based upon personal loyalty to Diem, not loyalty to Vietnam. Young, able officers are passed over to the benefit of political hacks. Morale in the lower ranks, especially since the battle isn't going well, suffers. When ranking officers are competent and succeed in building an effective fighting unit, a unit with esprit de corps and trust in its commander, Diem sees it as a threat to himself rather than a threat to the Viet Cong. The commander is then transferred or sent to the States for schooling. Ziem strictly limits troop movement not previously cleared with his office. Hot pursuit of the Viet Cong is prohibited. The loyalties of the soldiers is also questioned, and village conscripts are not allowed to serve near their own homes for fear of desertion. Ziem ignores his senior officers, and in the words of Stanley Carnot, like a model railroad enthusiast dispatching toy trains hither and yon, he occasionally picks up a telephone in his palace and capriciously orders a battalion to pack up and move 500 miles without informing anyone else of the directives and leaving all his subordinates wondering where the troops went. Many observers feel that Siem is actually disliked intensely by the army. Jerry Rose notes, The ordinary soldier, who receives about $10 a month, one or two days leave in one or two years, if he's lucky, and no promotion at all unless he oils the palm of an officer or has influential friends, laughs at you when you ask him why he was fighting. Desertions from the army are increasing, and many are going over to the Viet Cong, arms in hand. Even among high-ranking officers there is vast discontent. One very high-ranking officer said to me, We are discussing a coup, but Diem has so organized the army that we have no command over troops. Even with such tight control, an attempted coup did take place in November of 1960. The very force which had put Siem in power, the paratroopers, had attempted unsuccessfully to remove him. Again on February 27, 1962, two fighter bombers of the South Vietnam Air Forces strafed the Saigon airport and bombed the palace. The attack appeared to be a lonely and fruitless effort, isolated from any broad-based plan. Of the two pilots, one escaped to Cambodia, the other, a flying ace who had flown hundreds of missions against the Viet Cong, simply asked when picked up, Did I kill that filthy character? Even though most observers felt that the latter attack was an isolated incident, the South Vietnamese National Assembly passed a resolution that same week asking the president to end the policy of clemency and take drastic measures against irresponsible elements. As late as May 11, 1962, on a special CBS television program, Eyewitness Yanks in Vietnam, the narrator said, The army is on a leash since the recent palace bombing. A decree from Diem orders that no plane could carry big bombs since the attack. In the midst of such chaotic conditions, a full-fledged war is raging just a few short miles outside of the city limits of Saigon. Diem's success in fighting this war and his method of dealing with the opposition demonstrates aptly the quality and character of his government and they will be the subject of our next report. Philippe de Ville, author of the standard book on the early stages of the Indochina War, was quoted earlier in this series of reports. In a recent article, The Struggle for the Unification of Vietnam, he has dealt at length with the opposition to the Diem government. To put this opposition in perspective, we shall return to 1954 and Diem's first consolidation of South Vietnam. As we said, Diem did not have a political party when he took power, and his personal prestige, which was high, could not on its own make up for this absence. He did, however, have several things in his favour. His past seemed to testify to patriotism and integrity, his uncompromising anti-communism, did not appear to stem from self-interest, but from his deep religious convictions. Diem had the unqualified support of the United States. 
Furthermore, the political regroupment contained in the Geneva Agreements allowed hundreds of thousands of people from North Vietnam to migrate to the South, about 900,000 in all. Most of these people were Roman Catholics, and they had not fled the North to risk finding themselves after elections two years later under communist rule or obliged to flee elsewhere. De Villiers writes, It was among those refugees from the North that Diem recruited his guards and the cadres faithful to his regime. He then moved into control of the army and began his fight against the religious sects. Although he was successful in major urban areas, Continued resistance was reported from the countryside. In fact, the New York Times carried regularly and continuously articles dealing with mopping up exercises from 1955 to 1959, when the tone of the articles changed. At first, only sporadic reports of skirmishes and deaths appeared. Gradually, the estimates of the number of rebels and the number of deaths increased. In 1957-58, there was a steady trickle of about 30 to 50 dead a month. Late in 1959, the figure had increased to 10 a day, and in the spring of 1960, a figure of 25 a day was used in the press. British officials estimated in March 1961 that deaths had reached 200 villagers a month and that the total dead for 1960 was around 3,000. In a press conference on May 5, 1961, President Kennedy spoke of the loss of 4,000 civil officers in the last 12 months in Vietnam alone. By the end of the year, casualty figures had risen to more than 1,500 dead a month, and in January 1962, they were set at a rate about double that of the previous month. Vietnamese losses in this undeclared war run, if the figures are accurate, at about twice the rate of the French during the Indochina War, and about two and a half times those suffered by the United States in Korea. A perusal of all the articles dealing with Vietnam in the New York Times from 1954 through 1962 shows that at no time since the end of the French Indochina War has South Vietnam been pacified. From 1955 until 1958, those who resisted the Diem government were referred to by the proper names, Cao Dai or Hao Hao, or by the words and phrases anti-government groups, terrorists, bandits, rebels, and occasionally, toward the end of this period, communist-inspired terrorists, communist-inspired bandits, and so on. On February 7th, 1958, a story appeared in the Times, filed by Greg McGregor, which more directly referred to the communists. Communist activities worry Saigon officials who claim that communists in Saigon alone may be anywhere from 15,000 to 70,000, he wrote. From late 1958 until March 1961, the rebels were referred to as communists, but disagreement on this point was frequent. In the July 10th, 1959 issue of the New York Times, two stories seemed in contradiction of each other. A story on the first page with the subhead, Red Terrorists Kill a Major and a Sergeant, said increasing communist terror here in Saigon was emphasized sharply when two United States soldiers of MAAG were killed. But on the following page was Christian Herter's reply to a question about the killings of the two American soldiers in South Vietnam. He said, I don't think you can relate that directly to communism in South Vietnam. There have been terrorist organizations operating in that country for some time. A Reuters dispatch in the New York Times of April 17, 1960, carries two sources which simply call the rebels communists. Authoritative U.S. government sources said that the Vietnamese communists have launched a new drive against the pro-West Diem government. The South Vietnamese government sources said, Captured communist documents showed the Vietnamese communist aims and sources also say the Vietnamese communists call themselves liberation forces. Admiral Felt, later on May 29, 1960, called the rebels bandits, but by November 1960, the rebels were being called exclusively communists. In April 1961, South Vietnam military officials reported 
3,000 communist agents from North Vietnam infiltrated this year, captured documents said. In an official letter, Diem said, an announcement earlier this year by Hanoi that rebels in South Vietnam had formed a Marxist-Leninist party was an admission that communist guerrillas known as the Viet Cong were directed by North Vietnam. There are, it is evident, a number of different groups in opposition in South Vietnam. Without pretending to list all of these, we can mention at least five. Troops infiltrated from North Vietnam, independent guerrilla forces in the South, but uh, both communist and non-communist, opposition religious sects, liberal democratic opposition within South Vietnam and in exile, and five, military disaffection. The Diem government tends to lump all these groups together, and any opposition is called communist. While several years ago the American press was more careful, in general it too now lumps the opposition into only two camps, communist and anti-communist. The United States government, publicly committed to Diem, also presents the struggle in communist-anti-communist terms. Such a simplification, however, obscures more than it illuminates. While the communist-anti-communist struggle is an important one, there are two other major issues. Vietnamese nationalism and the question of unification, and secondly, the dictatorial character of the Diem government. These issues combine to make a patchwork of some confusion. We have already pointed out that North and South Vietnam were complementary economic regions, and thus Vietnamese nationalism and the drive for unity is firmly based in the country's economy. We pointed out also that North Vietnam we pointed out also that North Vietnam in the Geneva Accords had negotiated for a formula of eventual reunification through elections. It has been South Vietnam, backed by the United States, that has prevented such reunification. De Ville writes, the intransigence of the South has, in fact, destroyed any hopes which the North might have had of putting its reconstruction policy and its economic development upon a pan-Vietnamese footing and has forced it to seek the aid necessary to it exclusively in the communist bloc. The South's decision has probably contributed towards pushing the North into the arms of China. And has not the South, by its refusal, condemned itself to an ever-increasing state of dependence in relation to its great protector? Thus, the South is, and is seen by many South Vietnamese to be, the major obstacle to reunification. Those groups in South Vietnam that wanted reunification with the North found themselves after 1956, when it became apparent that the elections would not be held, without any formal legal recourse. North Vietnam itself announced that the struggle for unity would be long and difficult. Resurgent Viet Minh groups in the South that had kept silent waiting for the elections after 1956 doubtless began to consider again active armed struggle. At the same time, the quasi-legal protection that the Geneva Accords granted them was removed when the Geneva Agreements were to all intents and purposes buried by the South. As de Ville writes again, men who fought with the Viet Minh have since this date been to all intents and purposes outlaws. The Diem government launched out in 1957 what amounted to a series of manhunts. The population was called upon to redouble their vigilance and to denounce all communist activity. The organization of the police, which was already elaborate, was yet further strengthened. Guided by informers, mopping up exercises became only too frequent. A considerable number of people were arrested in this way and sent to concentration camps or political re-education centers, as they were euphemistically called under conditions which, to be sure, reflected no credit on a state which proclaimed itself to be a respecter of the human person. This repression was in theory aimed at the communists. In fact, it affected all those, and they were many, Democrats, Socialists, Liberals, adherents of sex, 
who were bold enough to express their disagreement with the line of policy adopted by the ruling oligarchy. Often, too, in error, people of no political affiliations found themselves subjected to the repression. De Villiers continues, In 1958, the situation grew worse. Roundups of dissidents became more frequent and more brutal. The enemy were difficult to apprehend. Moreover, the way in which many of the operations were carried out very soon set the villagers against the regime. A certain sequence of events became almost classical. Denunciation, encirclement of villages, searches and raids, arrest of suspects, plundering, interrogations enlivened by torture, even of innocent people, deportation and regrouping of populations. As many other Western spokesmen pointed out, Diem's policy played directly into the communist hands. Viet Minh forces who remained in the south after the division began to fly back. We quote again from De Ville. The peasants, disgusted to see Diem's men acting in this way, lent their assistance to the communists and even to the sects, going so far as to take up arms at their side. The opposition and deserters found it increasingly easier to find hideouts they were able to set up more and more supply dumps and outposts and even to fortify villages. Within a short space of time, the guerrilla activity was transformed into civil war. In response to this resurgence of fighting, North Vietnam protested to the South in diplomatic notes. Under heavy pressure from the Soviet Union, with its doctrine of peaceful coexistence, the Hanoi government initially did little or nothing to aid its party members in the South. Then, in March of 1960, the Nambo Veterans of the Resistance Association published a long declaration claiming that the South Vietnam government had driven the people of South Vietnam to take up arms in self-defense. The declaration called for an end to the fascist dictatorship of the Ngo family and asked that a democratic government of national union in South Vietnam be set up in order to realize national independence and democratic liberties and to guarantee a decent life to the people. It is conjectural whether or not the Hanoi government encouraged or even wanted such an act of insurgency at this time. But in any event, it is clear that the Nambo veteran of the resistance movement were oriented toward the Hanoi government. Their declaration continued, a South Vietnam government should be set up in full and energetic implementation of the terms of the Geneva Agreement by entering into talks with North Vietnam with a view to the peaceful reunification of the fatherland. This government shall base itself on the principles of the Bandung Conference and institute a foreign policy of peace and friendship. Shortly after this manifesto appeared in March of 1960, the People's Liberation Army of South Vietnam was announced. This was not, however, the only opposition to Diem. Barely a month later, in April of 1960, 18 prominent politicians, including 10 former cabinet ministers, two ex-governors and Saigon's mayor, published a manifesto urging the government to liberalize its policies. In August of 1960, the Bloc of Liberty and Progress, another liberal opposition group, published a manifesto to the same effect. The government reacted to both with its traditional ferocity. The situation at this point was summed up by an influential nationalist journal in Saigon. The journal, after suggesting that the government would in all probability have to deal with a popular uprising, wrote, This rising is justified. In a country where the most elementary rights of the people are ignored, where the legality of the actions of the government has become an empty expression, the will of the people can only make itself felt by means of force, that is to say, by means of revolution and taking over the government. We nationalists, all of us, know that there is a race against the clock taking place between the Viet Minh and ourselves. Two months before this, the 22nd Communist Party Congress had taken place in Moscow, and the 3rd Congress of the North Vietnam Communist Party had taken place at the same time. Undoubtedly, the question of South Vietnam had arisen. What went on is unknown to us, but this was the Congress at which the Soviet Union denounced Albania, 
and urged its position of peaceful coexistence against the Chinese position of greater intransigence. We know also that Hanoi itself was divided between the two camps and tried as much as possible to steer a course between them. De Villiers concludes the prudent and pro-Soviet tendency finally won the day, but the activist faction scored many points. Ho Chi Minh demanded that greater efforts should be made to achieve unification, and it was the former guerrilla leader of Nambo who was elected party secretary. In this way, closer liaison with the South was assured. The situation was deteriorating there, and the North Vietnamese Communist Party was afraid that the situation would slip from its control. Shortly after these events, which we have outlined in some detail, in December of 1960, somewhere in Cochin, China, the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam was formed. This is now the organization that is conducting the civil war in South Vietnam. In two and a half years, it has gained control of the greater part of the countryside, including a large zone between the 14th and 17th parallels. It has developed an administrative network at the province, county and village levels. It has set up arms factories, coordinated outside aid, primarily from the north, of arms, ammunition, medical supplies and money. It has developed an effective propaganda campaign. Is the front simply a subversive campaign directed from Hanoi, as the Diem and Kennedy governments maintain? De Ville writes, The hypothesis is certainly a plausible one, and to formulate it serves the purposes of communist propaganda. But it leaves out of account the fact that the insurrection existed before the communists decided to take part, and even among the communists, the initiative did not originate in Hanoi, but from the grassroots where the people were literally driven by Diem to take up arms in self-defense. We do not at the moment know the composition of the Liberation Front of the South or its leading elements, but it, but it seems likely that it reflects a checkerboard of variety of the political forces within the opposition, even if all the delegates are not representative. Now, the majority of the opponents of Diem are still anti-communists. It is for this reason that the communists, even though they do play a preponderant part in the National Front, are in no position to comport themselves as if they were the dominant force, and indeed have to proceed with great caution. The communists, whatever the extent of their loyalty towards Hanoi, have had to take national or regional sentiment of the South into account. It is time now to look at the sum of the evidence offered to support the charge of direct North Vietnamese involvement in the war in the South. As early as November 9, 1960, the New York Times carried a story quoting the South Vietnamese Defense Ministry. The story said that it charged North Vietnam with infiltrating across the 17th parallel. The information came from captured documents and dead attackers who were photographed in North Vietnamese uniforms. The North Vietnamese uniforms are the same as those worn by all the resistant fighters in the French Indochina War, whether North or South Vietnamese. Again, in the fall of 1961, Takashi Oka reported in the Christian Science Monitor, prisoner of war testimony and captured documents apparently have convinced South Vietnamese military sources that the 803rd Regiment of the North Vietnamese 324th Division has entered the country and that after traversing the plateau region, entered the coastal provinces of Phu Yen and Binh Dinh. In addition, the 108th Regiment of the 325th Division is believed to be operating in the Quang Nai region east of Kon Tum. Also, there is an unconfirmed report that a 1,000-man force with 30 elephants crossed the Lao frontier. Oka commented, Independent observers are not certain that such positive identification can be accorded the increased Viet Cong activity. More evidence produced by the South Vietnamese government included the plateau regions in the past three months have seen a sharp step up in communist activity. The nature of the Viet Cong operations has broadened. The communists have begun to show an organized capacity to attack well-defended posts. The attacks show a high degree of organized military training. Therefore, the units doing these operations 
must be seasoned troops commanded by seasoned officers. Oka points out that such evidence, from an international legal point of view, would not stand up in a court of law. On page 23 of the State Department booklet, A Threat to Peace, it says, Military personnel are supposed to turn in all identification papers before crossing into South Vietnam. Weapons of Soviet bloc origin are generally shunned, and Viet Cong troops entering the South usually are supplied with French or U.S. weapons. To support the State Department booklet, a 102-page booklet, Part 2, was also issued, which contains pictures, translations of communist speeches, captured documents, diaries, and translations of confessions. A study of the two booklets reveals the following points. 1. The Viet Cong movement is receiving encouragement and verbal support from North Vietnam. 2. There is some indication, but no reliable proof, that the Viet Cong do cross into North Vietnam for rest, rehabilitation and medical care. 3. The persons who have been captured as infiltrators from the North are natives of South Vietnam, who, according to their confessions, spent a considerable number of years in North Vietnam receiving political training. 4. Captured equipment introduced from communist countries consisted of a few medical supplies, vials, tools, medical charts, books and small box of medicines. Beyond these four points, the documentary evidence proves little. Certainly it does not prove the bulk of the charges by the South Vietnamese government regarding terror, massive infiltration, large arms shipments and so on. While there is little independent evidence for massive material or personnel support by North Vietnam, there is ample evidence of such support in South Vietnam. The underlying factor, according to Robert Trumbull, writing for the New York Times, is whether the people are for the government or not. The people who fight President Ngo are the same who fought the French, and in their view, for essentially the same reasons. Western observers also noticed while watching the transferal of peasants from their villages to resettlement centres that they were either very old or very young. The men and women between 17 and 33 had gone into hiding or were serving with the Viet Cong. Takashi Oka reports that the Viet Cong could circulate through 75% of the country freely. Jerry Rose notes, to one degree or another, 70 to 90 percent of the entire population now leans towards the Viet Cong. Newsweek reported as late as April 1962, no amount of planning and no amount of technology can defeat the Viet Cong unless the majority of the Vietnamese people are persuaded to turn their backs on the communist cause. Takashi Oka spent 12 daylight hours in December 1961 walking through an area that had been occupied by the Viet Cong for two years, and he says that it is still occupied by them at night. Slogans and banners extolling peace, neutrality, democracy, and reunification festoon nearly every other hut and about every fifth tree which we passed. Many slogans denounce President Ngo and the Americans, but I saw not a single slogan mentioning communism. The people of the region seemed well fed, in the marketplace, merchandise from Saigon was prominently displayed, showing that the government blockade of the area was ineffective. The most recent reports from South Vietnam agree that the Viet Cong, or the National Liberation Front, could not act without the tacit and or open support of the people. Is this to say that all opposition groups have rallied around the front? Certainly not. Of the five opposition groups that we mentioned at the beginning, two are certainly independent. The liberal opposition, which comes largely from the ranks of the civil service and intelligentsia, is in exile. It has little contact with the people of the countryside and little power. The military opposition is in a different situation. It is in part compromised by its role with the peasantry. It has been disintegrated by Diemens himself. And at least a portion of it has deserted to the Liberation Front. The three remaining groups are clearly cooperating with the Front. That is, men infiltrated from the North, whatever their number, independent guerrilla forces in the South, and what remains of the religious sects. 
A new Chinese news agency report monitored in Tokyo Sunday, April 15, 1962, said the Liberation Front has called for a national coalition government which would unite the people of South Vietnam, fight against U.S. aggressors and war provocateurs and overthrow the Ngo Dinh Diem government. The coalition would trade with all nations, establish diplomatic relations with all nations, enter no military alliance and seek a step-by-step -step reunification of North and South Vietnam. The Viet Cong have grown in number and in strength. Stanley Carnot in 1961 estimated that the communist guerrillas numbered about 6,000. British sources estimated in March 1961 that they numbered 7,000, while at the same time US authorities estimated the Viet Cong strength at 9,000. Takashi Oka placed the numbers at 12,000 to 15,000 in October 1961. And two months later, Frank Child used the 15,000 figure. In December 1961, Takashi Oka wrote, Officials estimate the communist guerrillas to number 20,000. A highly qualified source insists that the real number is closer to 50,000. Time magazine of May 11, 1962, says that there are now 25,000 Viet Cong. Guerrilla warfare as practiced by the Viet Cong follows the general principles set down by Mao Tse Tung and General Jap. More important than arms, equipment and fighting itself, according to both of these writers, is the attitude of the people. Mao writes, the people may be likened to the water and the guerrillas to the fish who inhabit it. The battle can be won only so long as the peasant population can be relied upon to feed, hide and provide information to the guerrillas. General Giap points out that a guerrilla war can be waged in mountain or in delta with good human material or mediocre and even without arms since the guerrillas can equip themselves from enemy supplies. Enemy advances, we retreat. Enemy halts, we harass. Enemy tires, we attack. Enemy retreats, we pursue. A crucial question is to educate, mobilize, organize and arm the whole people so that they might take part in the war. This quote is from a handbook on guerrilla warfare by General Vo Nguyen Jap, commander of the North Vietnamese People's Army and commander of the victorious forces at Dien Bien Phu. On Vietnam activity in South Vietnam, Jerry Rose reports, Political cadres live among the people, even helping with the farming. The guerrillas paid the farmer for food and lodging in the place where we stayed. Stanley Carnow said, They scout villages carefully. When they take one, they hold it long enough to deliver political lectures and distribute pamphlets. Then leave behind them the threat of execution if they do not cooperate with information, food, perhaps recruits, maybe medical care. General Harkins stressed the terroristic methods of the Viet Cong by saying, for years peasants kept their mouths sealed for fear of having their throats cut by the communists. But the terror idea was doubted somewhat by Robert Trumbull in the New York Times. Instead of helping the government forces against the Viet Cong, many villagers spy on the army for the Reds, Considerable scepticism exists here that all villagers assist the Viet Cong through fear of terroristic reprisals. We will conclude this report with an estimate of the future made by de Vier. The methods and the nature of Diem's regime are indeed such that with every month that goes by the grip of the communists in Vietnam grows firmer over the forces of the resistance. The process which under the French regime between 1930 and 1954 operated in favour of the Communist Party, operates still today. For the fact is that the people of Vietnam have always been caught between communism and a form of anti-communism which they could not accept. In the days of the French, they had to choose between communism and a hated colonial regime. Today, the Americans give them a choice between communism and a dictatorship of a type which is at one and the same time fascist and medieval. Everything leads one to think that, as a leader of the liberal opposition put it, 
if they had at all costs to choose between communism and reaction, the masses of Vietnam would opt the former. The longer Diem's regime lasts, the more enemies it has, and the stronger communist and anti-American influences become within the resistance. De Villiers believes that the die is not yet cast, that there is time for the development of an anti-communist resistance, which is not fascist and medieval. To a large extent, this belief depends on the United States and its role in South Vietnam. Our next report will probe more deeply into the U.S. role in South Vietnam's civil war. The American historian William Appleton Williams, in his textbook, The Shaping of American Diplomacy, wrote, South Vietnam's relationship to the United States is of such an intimate nature as almost to preclude the use of the term foreign relations. This intimacy did not start until the mid-1950s when it became obvious that France would soon be divorced from Indochina. Asked to comment on the strategic importance of Indochina at a press conference on April 7, 1954, President Eisenhower stressed the following points. 1. There is the specific value of a locality in its production of materials that the world needs. 2. There is the possibility that many human beings would pass under a dictatorship that is inimical to the free world. And 3. There are the broader considerations which might follow the falling domino principle. The falling domino principle was explained by saying, if someone sets up a row of dominoes, and knocks over the first one, it is certain that the last one will go over too, very quickly. The loss of Indochina would set off the loss of Burma, of Thailand, of the Malay Peninsula, and Indonesia. In the economic aspects, the President concluded, it would take away that region that Japan must have as a trading area, or it would force Japan to turn toward China and Manchuria. The possible consequences of the loss to the free world are just incalculable. A month and four days later, at another press conference, the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, said, The situation in the area was that it was subject to the so-called domino theory. What we are trying to do is create a situation in Southeast Asia where the domino situation will not apply. With regard to free elections in Vietnam according to the terms of the Geneva Agreement, Dulles said, I said that I thought that the United States should not stand passively by and see the extension of communism by any means into Southeast Asia. We are not standing passively by. I have just said that I don't think the present conditions are conducive to a free election there, and I don't care now to answer the hypothetical situation of what might result if they did have elections. Since the Geneva Agreement, the United States has done anything but stand passively by. Over $2.5 billion in military and economic aid was sent to South Vietnam between 1954 and 1961. Military aid began in 1950, according to sources in the U.S. Military Aid Advisory Group, MAG. Two other organizations, TRIM, Training Reorganization Inspection Mission, and CATO, Combat Arms Training Organization, were founded in March of 1955 and May of 1956, respectively. In February 1955, Lieutenant General John O'Daniel assumed charge of the South Vietnamese Army, acting under the authority of General Paul Eli, French Commander-in-Chief of Indochina. When the French left, later, the U.S. command remained. After O'Daniel came Lieutenant General Samuel Williams. He was replaced in 1960 by Lieutenant General Lionel McCarr. In February of 1962, Lieutenant General Paul D. Harkins was sent to be a full general as head of a newly created U.S. Military Assistance Command. In face of the increasing strength and activities of the Viet Cong, General Maxwell Taylor was sent on a fact-finding mission to South Vietnam in the fall of 1961. The results of that mission were published in December 1961, along with a two-part State Department booklet. The booklet reviewed the situation in Vietnam and endorsed the falling domino theory. It accused North Vietnam of covert aggression and said that North Vietnam was guiding and supporting the Viet Cong effort. It charged the Communists with having utter contempt for the International Control Commission, 
and said that the International Control Commission had done little to investigate the many charges made by the Republic of Vietnam to the ICC. The booklet concluded, A Viet Cong victory would doubtless seal the fate of Laos, where the Communists already control about half the country. Cambodia's precarious neutrality would be subjected to heavy and steadily increasing pressure. Thailand, too, would have to expect to see the tactics used in Laos and in Vietnam directed against her. The present balance of forces in Asia would be tipped precariously. What, then, would be the prospects for Thailand and Burma, for Pakistan and India, for Malaya and Indonesia? On the same day as the release of this booklet, the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, said at a press conference, The report is based on countless individuals, agencies, and especially on the information supplied by the South Vietnamese government. It documents the elaborate program of subversion, terror, and armed infiltration carried out under the direction of the authorities in Hanoi. It is our hope that other nations will join us in providing assistance to South Vietnam until such time as the communists have halted their acts of violence. With this formal declaration and approval by both Republicans and Democrats, the United States began its stepped-up military assistance program. Ambassador Frederick Knowlton, Jr. gave more reasons for the accelerated aid to South Vietnam in a speech to the Saigonese Rotarians. He said, A majority of the Vietnamese do not want Viet Cong rule. The Vietnamese people are willing to make sacrifices to protect and preserve their independence. Under the dedicated leadership of your president, South Vietnam has been striving to attain social, political, and economic gains for the Vietnamese. South Vietnam has been subjected to an illegal attack by Communist North Vietnam under the guise of a national liberation movement, and Communist aggression in Southeast Asia must be checked in Vietnam. Knowlton concluded his speech by saying, It was absurd to suggest U.S. infringement of Vietnamese sovereignty, yet rumors that the U.S. sought military bases here were believed by anti-communist Vietnamese. In the meantime, Keyes Beach of the Chicago Daily News Service, observing events in Saigon, noted that the U.S. had started a $60 million construction program to convert South Vietnam into a military base against the communist aggression in Southeast Asia. Beach said that there will be airfields, ammunition dumps, and naval facilities. Practically every major newspaper and news magazine in the United States has carried descriptive articles about the military buildup in South Vietnam since December 1961. Time magazine wrote in May of this year, At Saigon Airfield, a steady stream of huge globe masters unloads tons of electric generators, radar equipment, trucks, and Quonset huts. More than 80 H-21 Shawnee helicopters at four air bases are serviced by U.S. ground crews flown by U.S. pilots. The converted aircraft carrier Corps steams regularly upriver to Saigon, carrying men, munitions, and more helicopters. The latest figures estimate that there are some 10,000 United States military people in South Vietnam. Through them, we are committed to a three-stage pacification program that calls for 1. Anti-guerrilla training and military re-equipment of the Vietnamese Army, 2. Swift-moving offensive operations against the Viet Cong, and 3. Reconstruction of the nation's peasant economy. Operation Sunrise, the name of one new U.S. program, aims, one, to prevent the communists from getting so strongly established that they could establish liberated areas under political control, two, to block guerrillas from raiding villages, hamlets, and towns to get supplies, intelligence, and men, and three, to provide security for the villagers. Although the United States is in South Vietnam in strictly an advisory capacity, an increasing number of U.S. soldiers have been killed. As we pointed out in an earlier report, the bulk of the population is, in the words of one reporter, at best neutral and at worst hostile toward the government. In an attempt to reverse this situation, the United States has tried to implement a program of reforms. What is needed for victory is to win the hearts and minds of the people, says General Harkins, in the words of Time magazine, again and again. George K. Tannum, in his recent book, Communist Revolutionary Warfare, the Viet Minh in Indochina, emphatically says, Until Diem's government has the active and continuing support of the Vietnamese masses and of the troops, all the economic and military aid in the world, though it may delay it, will not halt the communist advance. It is by now clear, however, 
that Diem is not disposed to liberalization or to reform. In December of 1961, Courtney Sheldon, writing in the Christian Science Monitor, says that the State Department felt that it was having some success in convincing Diem of the need for reform. Scarcely a week later, a Reuters dispatch quoted highly placed sources in Saigon as saying that the United States had agreed in the Nolting No Talks to increase considerably U.S. economic and military aid to South Vietnam without requiring major internal reforms by the government. In November of 1961, while the U.S. was criticizing the Diem government for not having introduced reforms, Diem's controlled press in Saigon left loose a barrage of insults against the U.S. The Saigon Thoi Bao, on November 4th, printed an eight-column headline reading, Republic of Vietnam, no guinea pig for capitalist imperialism. Is not time to revise Vietnamese-American collaboration? And three months later, Mrs. Nu, in Saigon, at a Women's Day speech, said, Aside from the howling of the communist wolves, we are really surprised to see a section of the peoples of the free world continue to mouth certain sermons of pseudo-liberalism, which indeed are an insult to the democratic principles of free Vietnam. Indeed, we hear these various professors of liberty proclaim that the political and psychological ideals of the Republic of Vietnam are not attractive enough to draw the masses of people. An 11-point program was announced on January 4, 1962, which outlined a plan to reform South Vietnam. The 11 points are 1. Training of village officials 2. Development of rural health 3. Opening of primary schools in every village 4. Improvement of village to district radio communications 5. Construction of new roads 6. Development of agricultural credit 7. A large-scale insect eradication program 8. Special efforts for mountain tribes 9. Reconstruction of flooded Mekong areas 10. Public works to struggle against unemployment and 11. Pursuit of industrial development. What, if any, of these reforms will be implemented is uncertain. The only U.S. group prepared to train village officials, the Michigan State Group, was sent home in February of this year for being critical of the government. The last attempt to develop inter-village radio communications ended up with the Viet Cong receiving the radios. The existing roads were almost impossible to maintain in face of the war. Most of the other programs require a long-range overhaul of the social, political organization of the Republic. There is one program now in progress which is supposed to win the hearts and minds of the peasantry. Better known as the Delta Plan, the program was originally devised by Robert G. K. Thompson, who was former defense minister of Melea. The idea is simple. Separate the peasants from the rebels by putting them in fortified villages, where the farmers will be defended by their own self-defense corps and where their hearts and minds will be won over to the government by social services and propaganda. Descriptions of the hamlets bear out one comment by a U.S. major, these villages are no Disneyland. The outposts are surrounded by high bamboo fences, extensive barricades of barbed wire, deep moats, and minefields. Inside the defense perimeter are placed concrete bunkers. Descriptions of the villages and the occupation of them by on-the-spot reporters, indicate that the villagers are anything but cheerful. Quote, A typical strategic hamlet is Ku Chi. 6,270 local farmers are fenced in Ku Chi's sprawling area with eight miles of moats filled with bamboo spears and planks studded with eight-inch nails. Inside the village there are new government-built schools, orphanages, and a temple. Kong Hao youth members are recruited from News Kan Lao organization, explain government policy to the villagers. Where the hamlets cannot be combined or the guerrillas are particularly strong, farm families must be uprooted, their houses burned, the people and their belongings moved by force if necessary. Each farmer is promised a plot of land, a ration of food and seed for new crops. Only those whose names are listed on the census boards are allowed out to work in their fields, and they must be checked to see that they do not carry extra food to the guerrillas. At nightfall, a curfew bell rings. Anyone caught outside the fence after curfew is fair grain for the night patrol. 142 families were voluntarily or forcibly moved from several isolated settlements in the forest. Their old houses were burned by Diem's men. Watching the operation, U.S. officials felt that the Vietnamese would have done better to distribute pamphlets among the villagers. 
We wanted to achieve success, explained one of the Thiem's men. If we had told the peasants in advance, they would have bolted into the woods. Another reporter describes the operation of the Delta Plan this way. In each hamlet, the assembled farmers were told that they were being moved to a nearby strategic village to be equipped with a school, clinic, market, deep wells, and a defense force. They were promised $25 and a free ration of rice and dried fish to tide them over the first three months. Seventy families agreed to move. One hundred and forty other families had to be convinced at gunpoint. A concrete administration building and clinic were already standing at the village, but the peasants must erect their own thatched roof houses, dig a protective ditch around the site, and crown it with a dirt wall and barbed wire. The seventy families that had volunteered were given land already cleared. Those who had been reluctant were moved into barrack-like structures at the edge of the forest. Western observers noticed that the peasants were either very old or very young. The others were either hiding or were serving with the Viet Cong. The necessary equipment to build the hamlets is being furnished by the United States at a cost estimated for each hamlet from $8,000 to $10,000. Some 2,000 hamlets are being set up at present, and another 10,000 are planned by the end of 1962. While supporting the Delta Plan, General Harkins warns, you cannot put the whole country in strategic hamlets. Other Americans in Washington and in Vietnam are not even sure that the plan itself is a wise one. As an outgrowth of the Agroville system, the Delta Plan brings to mind once again the forced labor which antagonized the Vietnamese peasants earlier. Local administrators may abuse their powers, as they have in the past, writes a U.S. News and World Report newsman. Already many peasants falsely charged with being pro-communists are in jail merely because they have incurred the wrath of the village chiefs, landlords, or tax collectors. The feelings of the peasants being moved was described on a CBS television program as it was like the end of the world. Whatever the methods, the question asked in Washington is, are we winning? Many U.S. officials, especially military men, are convinced that the U.S. can and will win. In February, the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, and other top military and administrative advisors predicted the ultimate defeat of the Viet Cong. Robert Kennedy, speaking for the President, said in Saigon, We are going to win in Vietnam. We will remain until we do. Ambassador Nolting, according to Time magazine, has probably done more than anyone else to persuade Washington to stick with Diem. He knows all of Diem's shortcomings, his authoritative rule, his inability to delegate authority, his refusal to allow any political opposition, the excessive powers vested in his family. But Nolting sees no alternative to Diem. When asked by President Kennedy in Washington last January whether we could win with Diem, Ambassador Nolting replied, Yes, but it will be difficult. The official attitude reminds one of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's verdict in the case of the Nicaraguan dictator Anastasio Somoza. He's a bastard, but he's our bastard. However, the official administration pronouncement still attempts to give ideological justification to the U.S. role in South Vietnam. Recently, in April of 1962, the State Department released a pamphlet based on a talk by Under Secretary of State George Ball. Ball asked and answered the question, But one can say, what does this mean to us? Granted, the valiance of the Vietnamese people, the high quality of their fighting spirit, how does a guerrilla war 10,000 miles away in the fetid jungles of Southeast Asia concern America? How is it relevant to the larger interests of our policy? Is it worth the millions of dollars we have poured into Vietnam or the risk of American lives? The answer to all of those questions must be affirmative. We have consistently given that answer for a number of years. In 1955, with the overwhelming approval of the Senate, the United States joined its partners in the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. Although because of the provisions of the Geneva Accords, South Vietnam could not be a signatory to that treaty, the protective umbrella of the treaty was extended to cover Vietnam by means of a protocol agreed to by all the signatories. The protocol of the CETO Treaty is an expression of the signatories' vital interests in the preservation of the integrity and independence of Vietnam. Those interests derive both from geography and from the very nature of the power struggle now going on in the world between aggressive communist power and freedom. 
If the Vietnamese people were to lose the struggle to maintain a free and independent nation, it would be a loss of tragic significance to free world interests in the whole of Asia and South Pacific. And more than that, if the United States were to neglect its responsibilities to the Vietnamese people, the consequences would not be limited even in those areas. They would be worldwide. For the free world security cannot be given away piecemeal. It is not divisible. When the going gets rough, we cannot observe those responsibilities that are easy or near at hand and disregard the others. What we do or fail to do in Vietnam will be felt both by our antagonists and our friends. How we act in Vietnam will have its impact on communist actions in Europe, in Africa, and in Latin America. And later he added, Can the Vietnamese win their battle against the communists even with our help? Here again, the answer is definitely yes. This little pamphlet concludes, The Vietnamese people are sturdy and resilient, and they have the will to win. And when they do win, the world can count one more victory on the side of freedom and justice. Outside of these official circles, expressions are more doubtful. Unless we get reforms to widen the base of the government's support, we cannot win in Vietnam, warned a Michigan State University professor, Lloyd D. Musloff, formerly head of the U.S. team of appointed advisors to DM. He goes on to say, of course there has been progress on the military side, but Siem has made no progress in gaining the support of the intelligentsia or the mass of the people. As a consequence, we are losing and will continue to lose. More recently, in July of 1962, Homer Biggert wrote, Victory is remote, he continued. From the strictly military point of view, the situation has been improving. We are now doing a little better than holding our own was the cautious assessment made a few weeks ago by Major General Charles Tynes, chief of the Army Element of the Military Assistance and Advisory Group. Biggert goes on to report that by next year, ZM will have 350,000 men armed and equipped by the United States, fighting some 25,000 guerrillas fighting with primitive weapons. Nonetheless, he writes, the issue of victory remains in doubt because the Vietnamese president seems incapable of winning the loyalty of his people. Pigott raises what is perhaps the crucial question for Americans. What if the situation disintegrates still further? He concludes, Washington may face the alternative of ditching no Dim Ziem for a military junta or sending combat troops to bolster the regime. No one who has seen conditions of combat in South Vietnam would expect conventionally trained United States forces to fight any better against communist guerrillas than did the French in their seven years of costly and futile warfare. For despite all the talk here of training men for jungle fighting, of creating counter-guerrillas who can exist in forests and swamps and hunt down the Viet Cong, Americans may simply lack the endurance and the motivation to meet the unbelievably tough demands of jungle fighting. The war has thus far been fought with guerrilla tactics, outlined in the previous report. And as the war has progressed, United States military circles have been pressing a program of guerrilla activity of their own. However, the guerrilla program, as it has leaked to the press in unconfirmed, scattered reports, varies from that of Giap, Mao, and Che Guevara, where the stress is on political indoctrination and winning the loyalty of the people. In April, for example, the United States Air Force announced a highly secret anti-guerrilla program under the code name of Jungle Jim. Among the aspects of this plan was the use of transport planes to rain concussion bombs on what are called communist-infested jungle areas. The bombings would burst the eardrums of guerrillas. No mention was made of the local population, crippling them and demoralizing those who were not injured. Currently, the U.S. Air Force is training the South Vietnamese to fly planes equipped with chemicals for defoliating vegetation and destroying sweet potato crops. Again, the purpose is to destroy cover and food supplies for the Viet Cong, but again, no account is taken of the local population. The Army, Navy, and Marine Corps have similar anti-guerrilla programs with similarly intriguing special weapons. Bigot reports that the United States Advisory Group in South Vietnam wanted 1,000 dogs used to sniff out guerrillas. About 200 have been sent, but unfortunately most have turned sick and many have died. More important, someone discovered that the dogs eat about $1.20 worth of food a day, while the South Vietnamese soldier is allotted $0.19 cents 
for food a day. David Nuttall, a civilian attached to the U.S. Special Forces, is experimenting with a poisonous shrub. The shrub has leaves with nettles that cause excruciating pain. Mr. Nettle has proposed that the shrub be used to protect the strategic hamlets. Such programs are being used in other areas as well. For example, the Special Advisory Group is arming a group of primitive tribesmen who a few years ago were forbidden to use their traditional bows and arrows because of separatist tendencies. The American mission lives with the tribe, eating their food, drinking their rice wine, and attending their sacrificial rites. They are being armed with modern machine guns and rifles and politically indoctrinated. According to reports, in December of 1961, the United States forces are now training guerrillas to carry out raids in North Vietnam. In the meantime, the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union have issued what are referred to in the United States as warnings. In a statement broadcast by Peking Radio on February 24, 1962, the Communist Chinese Foreign Ministry declared that China's security was seriously affected by an undeclared war being waged by the United States in South Vietnam. An Associated Press report the next day said that the ministry also demanded the immediate withdrawal from South Vietnam of all U.S. military personnel and equipment and demanded immediate international consultations to eliminate the serious danger of war in southern Vietnam by peaceful means. In March of 1962, the Soviet Union, acting in the capacity of co-chairman of the Geneva Agreement, accused the United States of fighting an undeclared war in South Vietnam and demanded the immediate evacuation of U.S. military personnel. Military and diplomatic officials in the United States, however, have argued that Communist China and North Vietnam would not send full-scale military units across the border. A New York Times story of February 17, 1962, notes, If North Vietnam sent regular military units across the border, there would be immediately a Korean-type war, and officials are certain that the Vietnamese Reds do not want this. They are equally confident that Communist China will not openly intervene because such intervention could spark a nuclear war. Secretary of State Dean Rusk did not believe that the Communist Chinese would use further assistance in South Vietnam as a pretext for entering the fight directly. And General Harkin's staff, quote, is guardedly optimistic that Red China will not massively intervene to help the Viet Cong. One reason, because of strained Moscow-Peking relations and of the staggering problem of supplying any large body of troops over 20,000 miles of single-track Chinese railroads and through hundreds of miles of jungle. Whatever these speculations may or may not be, the United States has ignored any warnings from the Soviet Union or Communist China. A New York Times press release of February 26, 1962, quoting administration officials, said, Although no official comment has been made, officials here, that's Washington, said the U.S. policy would continue to be one of offering all necessary aid to South Vietnam, and the United States is not interested in engaging in any international consultations over the situation in Vietnam as demanded by Communist China. The hostilities would cease, according to U.S. officials, if the North Vietnamese would comply with the terms of the Geneva Agreement. When newsmen asked Secretary of State Dean Rusk if the United States was not violating the terms of the Geneva Agreement by arms shipment to Vietnam, Rusk answered, It is no violation to protect oneself against the other party's breach. If the Communists would comply with the Geneva Agreements, there would be no trouble on the other side. They broke it first. Unfortunately, here again, the issue is not as clear as the United States government would like to make it. In the last and final report on South Vietnam, we will deal with the International Control Commission and its findings. Chapter 5, Article 27 of Agreement on the Cessation of Hostilities in Vietnam, generally referred to as the Geneva Agreement, reads, The signatories of the present agreement and their successors in their function shall be responsible for ensuring the observance and enforcement of the terms and provisions of these agreements. The following chapter, Chapter 6, set up a joint commission 
composed of equal parts of both sides to the agreement, that is, the French forces and the Viet Minh, and also an international control commission to implement these responsibilities. The mandate of this commission and its method of operation were outlined as follows. Article 34 reads, An international commission shall be set up for the control and supervision of the application of the provision of the agreement on the cessation of hostilities in Vietnam. The commission was composed of Canada, India, and Poland, presided over by India. Article 41 said, The recommendations of the International Commission shall be adopted by majority vote, and noted that if the votes were divided, the chairman's vote would be decisive. It then continued, The International Commission may formulate recommendations concerning amendments and additions which should be made to the provisions of the agreements on the cessation of hostilities in Vietnam in order to ensure a more effective execution of that agreement. These recommended actions shall be adopted unanimously. Article 42 specified, When dealing with questions concerning violations or threats of violations which might lead to a resumption of hostilities, namely refusal by the armed forces of one party to affect the movements provided for in the regroupment plan, or violations by the armed forces of one of the parties of the regrouping zones, territorial waters or airspace of the other party, the decisions must be unanimous. Thus the Control Commission was given no power for action itself. It could only make recommendations to the Geneva Conference presided over by the Soviet Union and Great Britain. It should also be noted again that South Vietnam and the United States did not sign the Geneva Agreement. Thus, after the French withdrew their troops and influence from the area, the ICC was forced, was forced in the South to deal with powers that did not recognize its mandate. Furthermore, the Geneva Agreements called for elections in two years, and the provisions of the agreement were designed to implement those elections, preventing any outbreak of hostilities before they were implemented. Once it became obvious that elections would not be held, the position of the International Control Commission became vague. Its functions were to have ceased after the elections. How long should it continue without elections, and what should it do? Unfortunately, these points have never been thoroughly clarified. About all the International Control Commission has done is issue interim reports, 12 since 1954. Interim reports of the ICC are sent to its two co-chairmen, Great Britain and the Soviet Union. Each report is divided into chapters, of which there are usually seven. Chapter 1 deals with operation and machinery of the Commission and the various demilitarized zones in both North and South Vietnam. Chapter 1 of the first four reports dealt with routine matters of establishing the Commission and the operation of it. The fifth report complained that the Commission is unable to investigate alleged violations in South Vietnam because A. The French High Command will not help as obligated in Article 25 and B. The lack of agreement by the Republic of Vietnam with the Geneva Agreement. In the seventh interim report, August 1956 to April 1957, while briefly noting that the Republic of Vietnam allegedly had violated Cambodia's territory, this, incidentally, is the first official reference to any Cambodian-South Vietnamese border clash, and that air service for investigatory purposes in the People's Republic of North Vietnam was now satisfactory, the Commission reported that Gourmet Singh, a member of the Commission, was shot and killed by a policeman, and Mr. A.E.L. Cannon, also a member, was murdered. Both incidents happened within the metropolitan area of Saigon. The Ninth Interim Report, May 1958 to January 1959, reported that the Cambodian situation had developed when 90 Vietnamese had escaped to Cambodia and wanted to go to northern Vietnam. The Cambodian situation continued in the Tenth and Eleventh Interim Reports as Cambodia continued to lodge complaints against the Republic of Vietnam for violations of the border. Chapter Two of the Reports deals with the evacuation of the French from Vietnam and the administration of the demilitarized zones. No problems to speak of arose as a result of the evacuation of the French. During the early part of 1956, the Commission investigated the demilitarized zones and requested of both sides that certain changes be made in the administration of the zones, such as the installation of telephones, buildings, and so forth. The seventh interim report said that North Vietnam had implemented the suggestions, but that the Republic of Vietnam had not. It also charged that violations of the demilitarized zones in the Republic of Vietnam had occurred when U.S. personnel went into the area. Concern for the violations of the demilitarized zones in the South was registered in the Ninth Interim Report, 
and after an investigation was carried on in 1959-1960, the Commission reported that the Republic of South Vietnam was issuing permits for entrance into the demilitarized zones. Chapter 3 covers the implementation of Article 14 of the Geneva Agreement concerning civil liberties and democratic freedoms in both zones. Each zone was to allow freedom of passage of persons from one zone to the other for a period of up to 300 days. From the time of the signing of the agreement until elections were held in two years, each party was to refrain from any reprisals or discriminations against persons or organizations on account of the activities during the hostilities. Each party was to guarantee democratic liberties. At first, the Freedom of Movement Clause received the most attention. At the time of the first interim report, numerous stories of non-compliance by the North Vietnamese came from Saigon. The Commission summarized the results of their first investigations by saying, Having received complaints that the Democratic Republic of Vietnam hindered people to go south, it discovered that no hindrance is being exercised, but that church authorities were exercising pressure on certain persons to move south. At Phat Giem, one of the places investigated, the Commission found 10,000 refugees congregated mostly in seminaries, cathedrals, and convents. At the suggestion of the Commission, the North Vietnamese made arrangements for giving food and medical aid and made necessary arrangements for transporting them. When the 300-day period for unlimited movement drew to a close, the Commission reported, as of this date, 13 violations by the French of Articles 14C and 14D resulting in the loss of life or injury to 319 and 203 cases of loss of freedom. Also, the independent status of the government of the state of Vietnam, which did not sign the agreement, makes it difficult for the Commission to carry out its obligations. The Commission said that both sides pressured refugees to move from one area to the other. An extension in the time for movement was made for refugee movement. The ICC reported an increase in numbers wanting to go north, because of fear of reprisals or discriminations in view of the anti-Geneva agreement and anti-communist propaganda taken up by the state of Vietnam in June and July. Continuing in the fourth interim report, the Commission said that while investigating charges that residents of North Vietnam were obstructed from moving, the Commission found some proof of this, but the People's Army of Vietnam worked more than required to speed the process of movement. As we noted, the Commission found evidence that North Vietnam religious groups, they were Catholics, were being pressured to move south. They also found, investigating a charge against North Vietnam having to do with Trappist monks, that, in the words of the report, the monks didn't want to go to the southern sector, or for that matter, anywhere. Nonetheless, this should not be allowed to obscure the fact that 893,000 refugees moved from north to south, while a scant 4,300 moved from south to north. However, the Commission reports contain numerous references to the inability of investigating charges against the South Vietnamese. If some 40,000 South Vietnamese were soon to be moved into concentration camps, it is not unlikely that a good portion of these political prisoners would have preferred to move north. The bulk of the Commission's reports on violations of civil rights and non-cooperation with the Commission were made with South Vietnam. In the sixth report, the Commission said that a law passed by South Vietnam gave special powers to the government to take extraordinary measures for detention or deportation for reasons of security. The Commission reminded the government that Article 14C superseded the order. During the same period, the Commission was unable to send out any teams in South Vietnam. The seriousness of this situation is obvious. It went on to say that the French Union forces admitted that some plantation workers were shot for requesting to go north, but that the Commission could not investigate the incident. As the years went by, the situation grew worse. By 1957, according to the seventh interim report, difficulties mentioned in the fifth and sixth interim reports in the Republic of Vietnam have remained and increased. In the meantime, the Commission reported on North Vietnam that a seminary still refused admittance to the Commission, and allegations regarding reprisals against civilians in North Vietnam who submitted petitions was found lacking in evidence. The implementation in violation of the Geneva Agreement of the South Vietnam Law mentioned in Report No. 6 was reported in the eighth interim report. The situation regarding Article 14 in both zones remained essentially the same throughout the rest of the reports. 
Chapter 4 of the Commission's Reports deals with prisoners of war. Prisoners were returned to both sides with only minor squabbles over numbers and deserters. Chapter 5, in light of the current situation, is the most important chapter. It deals with Articles 16 and 17 of the Geneva Agreement. According to the Articles, neither zone was to build their military forces beyond that which existed when the Geneva Agreement was signed. This also applied to the number of foreign advisers. The number of foreign military advisers allowed in South Vietnam was set at 685. New equipment, enlistments, personnel, and so on could be used only on a rotational basis. Investigations of violations of Articles 16 and 17 began with the first report, but not until the fifth interim report did the Commission indicate a major violation. In November 1955, while mobile teams patrolling North Vietnamese borders found no sign of arms shipments, the Saigon Fix teams reported that military aircraft, including U.S. Navy planes, were visiting the Saigon airport. Also, the teams were restricted to a certain portion of the airfield and could not see the unloading of the planes, which took place at the other side of the field. The same report said that after investigating a charge that armed shipments from Moscow were being shipped to Hanoi, the allegation proved, in the Commission's words, ridiculous. However, it charged that it was being obstructed in its duties in both the North and South, although the burden of complaint again was placed on the South. There it said it was obstructed by, one, not being given time notices of aircraft and naval landings, two, movements were not reported, three, material was seen brought in, but no mention of it was ever made in reports given to the ICC, and four, the teams were fixed in poor vantage points in South Vietnam. In North Vietnam, the teams moved to new spots and could not get an official extension of tenure in temporary locations. They were, however, allowed to remain in their positions to investigate. Under these conditions, the Commission reported that South Vietnam violated Articles 16 and 17 when U.S. materials were delivered, including the delivery of a number of LSTs and the entrance of the U.S. Army Service Corps term without permission. By the seventh interim report, the North Vietnamese officials still refused to have a permanent team at one observation point designated earlier as a temporary post, but it did allow several mobile teams and a temporary one to remain there. Changes were also noted in South Vietnam where, after threatening to inform the members of the Geneva Conference, the government of the Republic of Vietnam decided to allow reconnaissance at Saigon Airport. At the same time, another airfield was closed to the ICC, and the government admitted building two new airfields. During the period of the seventh interim report, the Commission noted 96 violations of Article 16 and 114 violations of Article 17 in South Vietnam. The Commission at the same time did not consider violations of Articles 16 and 17 in North Vietnam as there were no team reports, notifications, complaints, allegations, or charges which warranted such consideration. By the ninth interim report, while still recording no violations against North Vietnam, the Commission requested that the U.S. group term cease to exist and recorded 33 violations of Articles 16 and 17 by South Vietnam. The tenth interim report also said that investigation in North Vietnam was satisfactory and no violations of Articles 16 and 17 had occurred. It reported 32 violations of the two articles in South Vietnam. Report number 11 reported 34 violations by South Vietnam and no violations by North Vietnam. In the same report, the Commission continued to report satisfactory investigatory conditions in North Vietnam, but three mobile teams were closed out in South Vietnam, airfields were off limits to reconnaissance, and the Commission was not receiving reports regarding the operations of the U.S. military missions. Chapter 6 deals with cooperation with the Commission. The first reports contain only minor notations. The fifth reports, teams are obstructed heavily in the south by the government of the republic. In the north, obstruction of teams was removed when reported to the People's Army of Vietnam. Difficulties encountered in each zone were listed in the sixth interim report by areas. Of the south, the ICC said, one, teams were not allowed to investigate alleged violations of articles 14C and 14D, two, Articles 16 and 17 were definitely not implemented. Three, major areas of South Vietnam have been impassable. Four, mobile teams for major areas of South Vietnam have not been allowed. And five, South Vietnam has not implemented recommendations regarding civilian prisoners, notification of arrival of war materials, 
and investigation procedures. Difficulties in North Vietnam were, one, investigators were not allowed inside the grounds of a Trappist seminary, two, the boat provided for reconnaissance of the coast is not adequate, three, air service while provided for investigation trips into the interior has been unsatisfactory, and four, replies regarding the request to allow a permanent post in place of a temporary one have not been satisfactory. Little change occurred regarding these difficulties in the 7th, 8th, and 9th interim reports. But in the 10th interim report, the Commission said in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam it was receiving the required cooperation, while from the government in South Vietnam it was restricted in its operations. This situation continued throughout the rest of the reports. Concluding each report is a chapter aptly titled Conclusions, which summarizes the period of the report, attitudes, problems, and so forth. The first four reports, while noting many problems, notes also that any commission faced with the prospect of policing a truce would have problems. The concluding chapter was more pessimistic in the fifth report. It reads, The review of the four months' activities presented in this report, in the view of the majority of this commission, shows a further deterioration of the situation in Vietnam, causes serious concern about the implementation of the Geneva Agreement, particularly in view of the continued non-acceptance of the Geneva Agreement and the final declaration of the Geneva Conference by the Republic of Vietnam, and also confirms the fear expressed by the majority of the Commission in the fourth interim report that the Commission cannot work with any effectiveness unless the difficulties mentioned in these paragraphs are resolved by the co-chairman and the Geneva powers without delay. Paragraph 53. The Canadian member of the Commission, while agreeing with the other members on the extent of cooperation and problems in South Vietnam, filed a minority report which re-emphasized the problems facing the Commission in North Vietnam. In the sixth interim report, the entire Commission reported, As has been revealed in the preceding paragraphs, the degree of cooperation given to the Commission by the two parties has not been the same. While the Commission has experienced difficulties in North Vietnam, the major part of its difficulties has arisen in South Vietnam. The next three reports concluded with the ICC registering concern over 1. lack of progress to hold elections, 2. the encroachment of South Vietnam into the demilitarized zones, and 3. the refusal of South Vietnam to recognize the Geneva Agreement. Throughout the 11 reports, there appears no mention of the hostilities in Vietnam, even though those hostilities were claiming more lives per week than were lost in the French Indochina War. This is not as strange as it may seem at first glance, for the hostilities were taking place in South Vietnam, where the Commission's activities were severely limited. No twelfth report has yet been submitted. The 11th covers the period up to February 28, 1961. In June of 1962, however, the ICC did make a special report to the co-chairman of the Geneva Conference. With regard to the serious allegations of aggression and subversion on the part of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and the Republic of Vietnam, and the serious charges of violations of Articles 16, 17, and 19 of the Geneva Agreement by the Republic of Vietnam in receiving military aid from the United States of America. The report was filed by the Canadian and Indian delegate. The Polish delegation dissented from the report and filed a separate statement. We will deal first with the question of subversion in the South by North Vietnam. The South had made such allegations in the past, when the ICC asked the Hanoi government to comment, Hanoi replied that it would resolutely reject all decisions taken by the International Commission relating to the so-called subversive activities in South Vietnam, a question which has no relevance to the Geneva Agreement. The ICC turned the charges over to a special legal committee. This committee reported first that, in its opinion, the parties involved in the agreement were responsible for the cessation of all hostilities in Vietnam and hence the charges of subversion came under its jurisdiction. It continued, Having examined the complaints and the supporting material sent by the South Vietnamese mission, the committee has come to the conclusion that in specific instances there is evidence to show that armed and unarmed personnel, arms, munitions, and other supplies have been sent from the zone of the north to the zone of the south with the object of supporting, organizing, and carrying out hostile activities including armed attacks directed against the armed forces and administration of the zone in the south. It continued, commenting that in its legal opinion, there was evidence to show that the northern zone was being used for inciting, encouraging, and supporting hostile activities in the zone of the south, 
aimed at the overthrow of the administration in the South. The legal committee did not support any of the specific charges of the South Vietnamese government, but said that further investigation was necessary in these cases. The Polish delegation dissented from the conclusions of the legal committee. The second aspect of the special report dealt with North Vietnam's charge alleging direct military intervention in South Vietnam by the government of the United States. Specifically, the charges referred to a bilateral military agreement, the gradual introduction of about 5,000 U.S. military personnel to be expanded to 8,000, the introduction of large quantities of arms and ammunition, and the establishment of a military assistance command. The ICC commented, since December of 1961, the Commission's teams in South Vietnam have been persistently denied the right to control and inspect. Thus, though they were able to observe the steady and continuous arrival of war material, including aircraft carriers with helicopters on board, they were unable to determine precisely the quantum and nature of war material. The Commission report also includes a communication it received from the Saigon government when questioned about this military buildup. Saigon replied, In the face of the aggression directed by the so-called Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the government of the Republic of Vietnam has requested the government of the United States to intensify the aid in personnel and material which the latter was already granting to Vietnam. The Commission commented, The Commission concludes that the Republic of Vietnam has violated Articles 16 and 17 of the Geneva Agreements in receiving military aid from the United States and Article 19 in establishing what amounts to a factual military alliance with the United States. Finally, the Minority Report mentioned the recent and deliberate tendency on the part of both parties to deny or refuse controls to the Commission's teams, and concluded, the International Commission wishes to draw the serious and earnest attention of the co-chairman to the gravity of the situation that has developed in Vietnam in the last few months. Fundamental provisions of the Geneva Agreement have been violated by both parties. The Commission nowhere commented on who may have violated the Accords first, but a careful reading of earlier reports clearly indicates that the bulk of the charges of non-compliance with the terms of the agreement fall on South Vietnam. The Polish delegation filed a separate statement, giving his reasons for refusing to sign the majority report. He argued that the report places on the same level the doubtful and legally unfounded allegation of South Vietnam on the one hand and the grave and undeniable violations of the Geneva Agreement substantiated by records and findings of the International Control Commission on the other. The Polish delegation also said, furthermore, the majority has ignored in its special report violations of Article 14C of the Geneva Agreement by the authorities of the Republic of Vietnam by persecutions of former resistance members followed by the persecutions of all democratic elements, which is certainly one of the most important causes of the widespread movement against the government of the Republic of Vietnam. He also mentioned the refusal of the South Vietnam government to discuss reunification. At this point, the matter now rests. North Vietnam has been formally accused of sending armed and unarmed personnel into the South for the purpose of organizing and carrying out hostile activities. The South has been formally accused of building up its military forces. The South Vietnam government and its United States supporters argue that North Vietnam started the war of subversion and that the military buildup is simply the legitimate response of a threatened power. And yet there is ample evidence that with or without North Vietnam participation, a civil war would be raging in the South. Political prisons would be full and democratic opposition leaders would be in exile. More important than this, however, is the fact that a war is taking place which is claiming more lives each month than the Indochina War itself. While each day's newspapers carry reports of increased victories by Jim and the U.S. Advisory Group, the victories are scored closer and closer to Saigon. During much of July, newspapers reported grenade attacks on American soldiers in Saigon itself. Victory by Jim, while possible, is still a long way off. As Secretary of Defense McNamara said in July, it is a question of years, not months. And as we have repeatedly pointed out, there are those who are not even this optimistic. Most recently, on July 16th, Colonel Vuong Van Dong, the former director of the Army Staff College in South Vietnam, said in Cambodia, where he is in exile, that the civil war cannot be won by the South as long as Jim remains in power. 
The colonel told the New York Times reporter, Jacques Nevard, that the only hope of defeating the Viet Cong in South Vietnam would be for the United States to support an alternative South Vietnamese government, one having the support of the people. And yet, as the days go on, the United States commits itself deeper and deeper to GEM. One other alternative has been suggested. Also in mid-July, the Central Committee of South Vietnam's National Liberation Front proposed a settlement of the Civil War with the same formula as that applied in Laos. A statement broadcast by Radio Hanoi on July 16th called for the formation of a national union government, general elections, neutrality, no military alliances, withdrawal of the U.S. advisory group, and a Geneva International Conference. Earlier in the month, the leader of the National Liberation Front, speaking in Moscow, said he would welcome a proposal for the formation of a neutral zone made up of South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. These proposals have met with no serious reply from the United States or the GM government. It appears at this time that the war will continue and that the United States' role in that war will deepen. It also appears that while a proliferation of opposition groups will take place, the last one was announced in Tokyo on August 16th, the struggle will more and more be between Jim and the communist leadership of the insurgency. And, faced with these two alternatives, most independent observers believe that the bulk of the peasantry will choose the communists. This series of programs was not designed to offer an alternative to the present course of developments in South Vietnam. It was primarily designed to stimulate discussion, review, and investigation of the issues involved. The difficulty of gathering the material for this series and of separating fact from fancy is to a large extent a measure of the lack of discussion and debate. Surely, if we are moving toward a war in Southeast Asia, these issues should be fully understood.